everybody. Welcome to Music City Live. I am Ryan, and we're here with Jay Porter, audio recording guru and world traveler and great friend of mine. Jay, thanks so much for coming on the show, dude. No problem, man. Good to be here. Absolutely. We've been talking about this for months, Yes, I feel like. Yes. Yes. And now it's here. Here it is. <laughs> and I was going to leave it till last, but I got to start with it. Dude, I love the hat. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> when did you start doing the hat thing? When was that? Uh, it's been a while. Yeah. You know, once you become a hat guy, it's you know, it's pretty quick. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. It's like a signature thing. Yeah. Boris absolutely. Boris from London Guitars here does the same yeah, thing. Yeah, Boris is Boris has always rocked a good hat. I can't sure. imagine Boris without a hat. And now I can't imagine Jay Porter without a hat. That's true. Yeah. I expect it now when yeah. I when I show up and I see you in the room. Um so the other thing that I wanted to make mention of as I was driving over here to do the show is I'm, I'm doing my, you know, my notes for the show. And I'm like, what can I, what can I talk to Jay about? And, I, and, and all I can think of, and I have a picture of this, uh, Jeremy in the folder. It's, it's the smile. You got to put the smile picture up. I just pulled this off here, <laughs> off your socials. This, as I'm, I'm sitting there, I'm writing the notes and I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, what, what can I, what can I ask Jay about? Cause we've known each other for a long, long time. Uh -huh. And, and I'm like, you know, I, I was talking with my wife, of course, last night, she goes, Oh, the Jay one's going to be easy. I mean, you guys can just sit there and talk forever. You've known each other. Right. And so I'm driving here and I'm thinking like, what am I going to ask Jay? And, and I, and I could just picturing you just smiling, you know, like, see, it's like right now. And so anyway, uh, just wanted to make mention that like that is that is the quintessential J thing that you are like one of the happiest like positive dudes that I know in this business for sure. Try to be for sure. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Tis the business of chaos. So exactly. the happiness and the chaos is always a blessing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, man. Yeah. But yeah, no, it's cool. Um. So, uh, dude, early uh early days. How did you? So, how, what sort of drew you into music? Um. Okay. So I would. Well, let's start here. Where were you, where are you from? Ingersoll, Ontario, just outside London. Yeah, there you go. And yeah. and then yeah. you went you so you're in Ingersoll, and then music. So, so I guess we'll start. Yeah, musically, where did music sort of come into your life? I think like my my parents were always just they were big music fans. You yeah. know, it was you know if we were awake, there was music playing in the house, and you know my my dad was you know very much the you know the quintessential '60s and '70s you know music so zeppelin beatles stones all of that stuff you know yeah, cre credence um yeah just all that stuff was playing all the time in the house and then um you know so i was always a music fan from a very young age like i still remember the first you know first cassettes i bought bon jovi slippery and wet there you go uh, it, there's there's dating <laughs> myself if you're wondering how old i was um but yeah and then, then the next one was metallica master of puppets so i oh, quickly dude. upgraded um but cassette cassette wow oh yeah <laughs> that's one up on me for oh yeah sure. <laughs> <laughs> a few years older than yeah, you yeah <laughs> sure, sure. only a few um but uh yeah and then you know i got into skateboarding at a pretty young age and music and skateboarding were always tied so closely together like mm -hmm. the soundtracks of yeah. those early skate videos and stuff were were huge and some of my friends that i skated with their older brothers always had like these huge music collections. So it just got into uh, a ton of like punk rock and, and then hip hop and punk rock, hip hop and metal were like the, the three genres of, of skateboarding and then having that classic rock background from, from my parents. Oh yeah. Usually. Um, the yeah. So I just like, I, I just started really consuming a ton of music at a really young age, but it was that Metallica Master of Puppets record that probably set me on my trajectory. That was Dude, you're not the first person even in this show to say that to me. Yeah. 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 It's it's uh yeah, they've had influence on so many people, man. For sure. It's crazy. Like yeah. literally crazy. Yeah. And then so you're in Ingersoll, you're going to school. At what point do you go, Yeah, you know, I wanna I wanna do work in music? Like what's where does that happen? Um wasn't something I thought was possible in Ingersoll. I never realized that it could be a career path at all. Uh, and then, you know, I finished high school. I went out west. Um, you know, I had no idea what I wanted to go to school for. Um, you know, so I just, you know, 
being a 19 year old, just hopping in my car and driving, driving West to find myself kind of thing. And just, you know, had fun and snowboarded and just partied and, you know, whatever else. And then I came back and while I was back here, I, a friend of mine's brother in Ingersoll Mm -hmm. was like, I'm going to Oyart. What the hell's that? Mm. And he's like, Oh, it's a school for audio engineering. I'm like, what? Like that, that's a thing. Cause at that point I had like, I had, I had learned about sound. I had played mute, played instruments and you know, I was never great at playing anything, but um, I had friends who were really great at playing stuff and I still dabble guitar, bass and drums and drums is what I started with playing. But you know, I've always played things, but I was really good at doing sound for people and yeah, knew yeah. that very early on. So I had done sound, but I was still like, what, if you can get paid for this shit? Like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Just didn't see it was possible. So when I found out that that friend was going to this school called OER and it was in London, and I started looking into it. It's like, yeah. that's what I want to do. Like, okay, I'm that's finally figured out what I want to go to school for, that I'm not going to hate my life for it. And that's, uh, yeah, that's how I ended up. Uh, sh- yeah, shout in. out to the guys from OER. Um, mm-hmm. We... Uh, we do a bunch of stuff with them and, and obviously the students, a bunch of the students have worked here and applied here. And, um, but yeah, we've got a couple of recording schools. We got Fanshawe, uh, of course, uh, in town and, and then, and then Oyer and you mm-hmm. did the Oyer path, right? Yep. Um, that's cool. And yeah. then of course started working here. I did. Yeah. yeah. Which, which was an adventure and a half at that <laughs> point. <laughs> right? uh, I remember those days very fondly. Uh huh. Uh, yes. And, and worth noting the, you know, the, while I was going to OER, I, you know, there was a call for like, uh, volunteers for Sunfest, I believe. Okay. And, you know, I was a couple years older than most OER students. Cause I had done, I had done the out West thing. Mm-hmm. I, had, you know, um, so I think I was like 23 when I went there and, uh, um, you know, so the volunteer path wasn't something I was going to take. It was just like, I, I'm too busy. I'm doing stuff. Like I was already, I was working in, a, I had a home studio and I was already doing all of this stuff while I was going to school. And your dad called me up and after I turned down the volunteer thing and he called me up and he was like, yeah, this is Ron from the PA shop. Uh, I heard you, you can do sound. And I was like, yeah. And uh, he's like, well, you know, if you if you're available this weekend we'd love to have you come out and i was like yeah no i've like i've already you know i'm not into the volunteer no no this is a paid thing and it turned out that your dad talked to bob breen who Mm -hmm. was at oer no i don't even think bob was at oer at the time i think he started there the next year but he was an oer alumni and ended up coming back to work there and uh uh, i had mixed bob's band in Ingersoll, because that's where Bob's from that's as right. well. Yeah. And I had mixed Bob's band at a bar and apparently did a really good job. So Bob, your dad was reaching out for people that might be able to work that weekend. And Bob told him, oh, this Jay knows what he's doing. You could hire him. Yeah. yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and so I went to the went to Sunfest and your dad said, you ever done monitors before? And I'm like, oh, yeah, absolutely. I, yeah. I had never done monitors before. I had no friggin' clue what I was doing. I'd fake it till you make it. <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> worked out. <laughs> yeah, worked out. Needless to say. Yeah, sometimes those things work out yeah. for sure. Yeah. I, I actually remember that. I remember um, <laughs> I remember that for sure. And and it was it's funny because, I mean, we're still doing that once in a while, you know, we're still calling, doing a call out for, for young guys to come and work. And it's just a never, it's a never ending cycle that, that whole thing, but it's not as plentiful as it used to be. I would say in live sound specifically, um, you know, lots of people going through for recording and going down that recording, recording their band or recording, whatever, doing hip hop or whatever path with those schools. Um, and certainly there are, students that want to do sound right but it's it's kind of like why he called you specifically right it's like hey so i heard you can mix yeah right i heard you can mix a live show yeah and there's sort of the difference right is is the difference between you know going to school and learning it in theory and then having experience and actually being able to successfully pull it off yeah right yeah Especially in that situation where it's oh, so intense. Like, totally. And, you know, and you, for those people that don't know about Sunfest, it's literally four days. It's an incredible festival here in London, Ontario. But it's four days, multicultural acts, acts from literally every country in the world over the course of the last 30 plus years. 
you know, instruments you've never seen before. You have no idea how to mic them up. And you're going from like a, a solo to a four piece to a duo to like a 30 piece. Yeah. And you're expected, and there's like next to no change over time. Yeah. Sometimes it's backline supplied. Sometimes they bring their own stuff. Some it, it, sometimes it's a combination. It's just it's literally like the the world's craziest thrown go. And and some of those acts are like they're the the Rolling Stones in their perspective country. Oh yeah. And it's like you know so they're just so used to having like being catered on hand and foot and like you know, having sound checks and having a crew that knows what they're doing and everything else. So they got the egos to match. And so you go into that situation mm -hmm. and it's like trial by fire. <laughs> they're just like, those dudes are like, they zero patience for anything. It was zero understanding that it's like, I I've never seen this box that you're playing. Um, where do I put the mic? Like, yeah. You know, freaking out. What do you mean? And then they've got their buddies in the crowd going, you know, oh, this mix is supposed to be everything's supposed to be bass heavy or or no bass at all. And he's like, I don't know. I'm just mixing it like a rock band. That's what I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's Canadiana. <Yeah. laughs> it's the Canadiana version for sure. No, it, it's it's an it's it, it's an incredible festival. And you know what? True trial by fire and great for anyone that wants to, you know, that has an arrogance about them when it comes to mixing sound, because it's not, like you said, it's not just about mixing at that thing. It's about pe the people too, right? Like, yeah. like dealing with all the different personalities and the language barriers, yeah. right? Like there's not maybe as much, maybe today, I, I haven't done a Sunfest show in a little while, but I did the first like 10 that we did with Alfredo and, and there were some ser serious language barriers, especially like some of the the China the acts from China, like certain acts, like and it was it was rough. And and like to your point, they would just grab the mic, like they would know that I didn't know, and they yeah. would just grab the mic and <laughs> shove it where it needed to go, right? Yeah, um, which is good on good on them because you know I'm sure it happens because they're traveling the world or playing other countries other than Canada, but like. It, it, it was an experience for me all those years doing those shows, but I was mo more lighting. I did audio, I think one year or two years, but I did, you know, main stage lighting and what a pleasure to do some of those genres like that. I would never otherwise get a chance to do lights for. It was a lot of fun. Oh like, yeah. You know, there was, I think I ended up doing three years of it, maybe four. Um, and you know, it was, it was some of my, some of my best memories for, for sure. Just uh, and a great, what a great way to start kind of, you know, yeah. not only obviously doing monitors, but, yeah. <laughs> uh, but what a great way to start with my dad and the company and everything. Just, just yeah. like a, you know, a fun, a fun show. I mean, still, still stressful in, in some ways, yeah. but, uh, at least yeah. the acts were, were great. Yeah. And then, you know, I, I, I finished OEA, you know, a few months later, a couple months later, I guess. And I went to my cottage in Peterborough and, uh, you know, got another phone call from your dad saying, uh, Fiesta del Sol's on, which was oh, Alfredo yes. from Sunfest other festival. It was Labor Day weekend. He's like, are you available? I was like, sure. So I drove back here from, from my cottage and, uh, and went into to work on that festival and in very much the, a similar vein, you know, yeah, international yeah. artists and everything. Um, and then the, you know, festival ended on the Monday night after the long weekend and said to your dad, I'm like, well, do you need help unloading your trucks tomorrow? Uh, and he's like, Oh yeah, I guess. Yeah. Come by the shop. And then I never left. <laughs> <laughs> and you're still here now. <laughs> yeah, and here I am back again, 20 years later. <laughs> <laughs> they never leave. Um, no, it's all good, man. And, and we had some good times, man. Like, yeah. no, we we're talking. You saw the the thing I said earlier about the five ton. Like, just that's some of the, the some of my like fondest memories of me and you hanging out, man. It's just like driving around in five tons, going to do like little uh, like you know co municipal community arena gigs. Yeah, well, I'm sure you remember, but maybe not right at the second till I remind you. But like, I think like two weeks after that Labor Day show, maybe two weeks. Um, you, Dave, and I were taking two five-ton trucks up to Peterborough 
Oh, and of we, course I remember and we this story. jammed them under the trees at the top of the hill at my cottage <laughs> yeah. and partied our faces off for a night at the cottage and then got up and went to uh, Trent University the next day and did a Biff Naked show. Biff Naked show, that's yeah. right. That was awesome. <laughs> it was, it, and it was interesting because, you know, that was one of the first times that I kind of felt almost, I wouldn't say like we were on tour, but it kind of, it felt like, you know, it felt like we were on the road. It was yeah. like, yeah, because we're, at the time we were a regional company, right? Yep. And so we're like, yeah, man, let's go. Yeah, we're on the road now. And then, you know, and then you're like, hey, we should go stay at the cottage. And yeah. Like, yeah, we should. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> that was fun. And the show was fun, too, the next day. It was a good show. We had a good time. Yeah. The students loved it. I still think of every time I'm at my cottage, which I just pretty much spent the summer there. Um, and it's like that little spot at the top of my hill. Uh, that we somehow jammed two five-ton trucks into <laughs> makes me laugh every time. I'm just like, yep. <laughs> and it was funny because we were like, you know, I can't remember who it was, but somebody's like, there's no way it's going to happen. Yeah. And, and like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It'll, it'll, it'll go. It'll go. <laughs> we'll make it work. <laughs> oh, that, was, that was just insane. And there's a photo floating around somewhere. I wish I had it. There's a photo floating around somewhere of Dave just being like, what? How did we do it? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, good times. Yeah. Um, so uh, around that same time, uh, we were noting earlier that uh, I was sort of getting the sales side was up and going at that time. Yep. Under PA shop um, uh, in the back, but then we wanted to sort of develop the warehouse, and it was getting bigger, and we were get buying more road cases and. Um, so we wanted to sort of move things out of there. So we moved and built the front showroom, which I think was, oh, I want to say, oh, three. Yeah. It would have been like, I think like late oh three. Cause that's, that's when I started. Was yeah. And, and there's a, if you go to the PA shop folder, Jer, um, there's some photos of that too, that I wanted to throw up. Cause there's like very few people that the one that says 2006 showroom, uh, because very few people, have even seen this because these photos like they literally only yeah. exist in my in my files right but yeah this was uh just just scroll through them there jared um but yeah this was the this was the showroom from 2003 to 2007 yep wow we had a lot of hosa <laughs> I forgot how much there was. Yeah, because I mean, you had, I mean, obviously when I got here, you had well established the DJ side of it. Yeah. You know, stacks of Tech 12s uh, in the corners and If all you that go stuff. back, go back one, Jer. Go back one photo. You got the, uh, all the, the reason and digit design stuff there in the bottom right. Yeah. See that? Yeah. Um, yeah, so that was that was right around that time when you, me, and Kyle were like, "Yeah, you know what? We should start doing this. Uh, uh, we should start doing this recording thing. We got the recording schools here in town, and we should yep. start selling recording gear." And yep. and you're right. Before that, it was very DJ PA heavy because yeah. that was. I mean, I always said the the whole Music City thing at the time PA shop. The whole thing was really uh, uh, it was my life, right? Parts of yeah. my life. You know, I did lighting, so I had lighting. I did sounds, you know, we had sound and concerts, so I did sound. We had DJ, so and I DJ stuff. And then, of course, the recording thing was I started to do dance, a little bit of dance music production. My brother was really into it. Um, and, you, you know, so the now and then you were there and had just come from Oyer. So the re recording thing was just natural. And there was really the M box had just come out. If we yep. really want to date ourselves, yep. the M box had just the come 002 out. 002 rack. 002 rack, yeah, <laughs> and and so 001 even, yeah, uh, but it had just finished, and then the 002 rack, the 002 came out. I and think, yeah, I think the when we finally got the Digidesign dealership, yeah, it was just as M box, just, yeah, and, and 002. 002 were just just yeah. starting to pop, and you yeah, know, and they was, needed somebody in town. I mean, when you have yeah. that many students and, you know, you need not only representation, but there was there was a need for support and software downloads and all that stuff because it wasn't as it wasn't like you were going on the internet to download software at that point. Yeah. It was all discs. Yeah, I mean, I spent so. the 2 years prior, you know, driving to Toronto anytime I needed anything. Mm -hmm. You know, you might get the guys at Teletech back in the day were able to help yeah. out with some things, but you know, with as far as Pro Tools went, it was like, got to go to Toronto. Yeah. And uh, I thought that was insane, and as did you guys. And it was like, all right, well, let's let's do what we can to get the dealership. And after, I remember just being on the phone with for hours with those guys, yeah. trying to convince them that, no, we're legit. 
we can sell this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and and in the end, ironically, we ended up going on to do almost, they had all these different categories and we ended up do, going on to do them, almost all of them. Yeah. Including like the, the, the D command and like all that stuff. Right. Yeah. So it worked out really good. And, and that was a fun time too, because my brother was just getting involved in the business and he was super young. And, um, and so that was, that was fun times. And, mm -hmm. and then, you know, around that same time we were, uh, we took over sort of the studio spot, right? So the studio was, uh, DB studios, Dan Broadback studios. And I've had Dan, you watched the episode, yep. I'm sure, uh, had Dan on the show and, uh, we took it over. And at the time we were like, ah, oh, what are we going to call it? And my, it was my dad that came up with the name. He's like, ah, oh, I'm going to call it waterline, <laughs> waterline studios is great name. And, uh, I still remember the logo. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. And, uh, so, you know, we call it waterline and it was like, okay, well, what do we need to do? And, uh, and that's where you and Kyle and, uh, shout out to Nick Pittman. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there was, you know, a little small little army of you guys that, that put it all together, uh, or put it back together and, and then redid it. And, and Jimmy was involved, I think, right. As well. Yeah. I mean, I, I got here and Jim had just <clears throat> finished building out the, the booths in that, in the live room. Cause Dan didn't have those when he had the space. That's right. Uh, and you know, he had just just done that and you know there were some problems with the flooring in there so i helped jim rip out all the old flooring and him and i put in the new flooring and then kyle and i found a pair of uh the, the big tanway dmt 15 system 1200s i think right yeah or sy yeah, system yeah, system 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 1200 something like that yeah yeah, yeah. yeah and uh that was what dan had in the studio prior there was two big empty soffit holes Yep. That that was the only speaker that would fit, so we tracked those down, and uh, and then yeah, with 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 Nick and Kyle and I spent you know days and days and days wiring up patch bays and and uh, everything else to kind of make that room yeah man functional, and we had the Mackie D eight B console in there. That's right. Um, and then we had, remember we were like the beta testers for that thing, and you know it was just problem after problem after problem. And then they were like, they called us up the moment it started working good for like a month. They're like, and we're bringing out a brand new one. We want you guys to have it. We were like, no. <laughs> so your dad went and bought a Sony DMXR 100, which was like the baby, the baby Oxford. It was a really good console. Still to this day, I know those converters were really good. Yeah. And we put that in there and then we started making it a somewhat working studio. Absolutely. So prior to that, your dad was basically using it for his band only. Yeah, right. And uh, after that, it was like, well, start... You know, I can start bringing some stuff in here, and we, you know, we, you know, probably, you know, thank God your your dad was as into it as he is. Cause as for a lot of this stuff, thank God your dad's as into it as he is, because yeah. otherwise it wouldn't be happening. But he would nope. he would throw money at stuff because it was his passion, and yep. he threw money at that till we got it kind of sustained in itself. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and um, yeah, by the time I left, you know, I was doing a couple couple sessions a week in that room. Yeah, I mean, still, still kind of consider it my my first studio build. Yeah, there you go, <laughs> nice. Yeah, and then yeah. you went on to build many, many more. I did. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that that those were good times, man. And yeah. uh, and I even remember that Sony console being in there. And I think there's, I have photos of that somewhere too. Um, and then I wish I did. Like we were talking about this earlier. Like, yeah. Like this time just predates digital photos. Like yeah. another year later, we all had digital cameras. We, everything was much better documented. No, I. But I, back then, it's there like, was photos, but I had to scan them, and I have them somewhere. But yeah, yeah, it's there's definitely photos of it, and I don't have, I don't think I have any photos of the Mackie DAB era. But, um, but then shortly after that, uh, I mentioned it earlier. We got the D command. Um, yeah, that was just after I left. And, I think you guys moved. Yeah, from, and we moved into that yeah. whole world, and that was sort of when Andre came on board, and I, I had Andre on the podcast as well. Yep. on the show and uh and then that was sort of andre's era at where it sort of rebranded from from you know uh waterline to charter house and then it's still charter house to this day and then sort of you know after andre moved on then of course then there's aaron you know and and the rest is history but yeah so that was the sort of the progression of the of the studio but um around that time you know uh kyle was uh uh there was that whole California thing, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, because Kyle wanted to go, my brother wanted to go to uh, California, and go to acting school, or at least my brother wanted to get into acting. And my dad, 
you know, again, going back to your point of, you know, him supporting things, right? Yeah. Um, that was one of the things he supported was, uh, was my brother and, uh, kind of, I think living somewhat vicariously through my brother too, even though I don't know if my dad ever wanted a budding acting career, but definitely wanted a career in music. And I think this was sort of his way of trying to give my brother that, right. It's that sort of that, that, uh, that chance. And, and so, you know, I would watch my dad, you know, sit on his, on his computer for hours and hours looking for stuff for my brother auditions and, you know, what he should do. And, but yeah, he went down to, uh to LA. And I think we have a photo, right? Uh, yep. The LA, there's an LA photo, the ocean studios, the ocean photo. studios photo. There it is. <clears throat> yeah. So, so what's this? So, uh, <clears throat> uh, so Kyle's living down there. I had never been to LA at the time and, um, you know, and, and Kyle and I had become good pals like, like Ryan and I had, and you know, that was the good, little little rewind i mean that was one of the coolest things about that era is we were like we were all like super good pals oh, yeah. we were hanging out at work and then we'd hang out outside of work too like yep. it was just yeah it was work hard party hard <laughs> yeah it was a lot of fun but uh yeah so kyle was living down there and it's like well crap i got a friend in la like i'm gonna take this opportunity to fly down there so i booked a cheap flight out of detroit and um and flew down and hung out with kyle for a week and uh, this studio, um, Ocean and Burbank, um, you know, that's one of the one of the biggest, biggest, baddest Neve consoles on the planet. Um, and a friend of mine from OERT, Matt Green, was was working there at the time. Mm. So um, I told Kyle, I'm like, we got to go see Maddie at at Ocean and so we can take a take a walk. And that's the first real cool, legendary, big room like L.A. studio that that I ever went into. Is it still going? That one's not. Yeah, that's yeah. what I thought. Yeah, that one, um, I forget where, I've read somewhere where that console ended up. And I don't know if anyone's taken over the room, but it's it's certainly, and, and Bob Breen, who I mentioned earlier, Bob actually worked out of that studio for a long time. Oh, really? Like the first Evanescence record was recorded there. Like some Jimmy Eat World stuff was there. Wow. A band called Ours. Like there was a lot of stuff done in that room. So it was a pretty cool thing for both Kyle and I to like go go hang in that space with with Maddie and yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. that's cool and yeah. so so was that was that your first time in LA that was my first time so yeah because yeah, and so you and we'll get into this in a bit but like obviously you're you've been down there now for a, for a bit and yeah. um what's it like living there versus living here like. <laughs> Just overall, <laughs> not, not nothing to do with the business or anything, just yeah. like life in general. I mean, it's just, it's a lot of stuff going on all the time. Right. And, you know, you think like, honestly, like Toronto's that way for two months a year, you know, go to Toronto in summertime, July, August, yeah. and there's festivals and there's shows and there's just everything. Like Toronto's a very happening city. I mean, there's, there's three cities in you know, the f top three cities in North America, and whether people realize it or not, New York, LA, and Toronto. Like Toronto is a legit big city and there's it's got a, a lot, lot of on. cool stuff going yeah. on, but it's seasons much shorter. LA is that like 12 months a year. So it's wow. like, yeah, the, the busiest and craziest of Toronto is stuff going on. That's what LA is like every, every minute of the day. I mean, I, I see it when I go down, but I go down in January, which, yeah. you know, is like, I don't know what January is in LA versus <laughs> Canada, but I imagine that it's not much different than Canada in January. It's, it's cold, man. <laughs> you know, colder, colder, uh, colder. And the water is already cold. So yeah. it's like, you know, I want that's the funny thing is we usually will go out on trips when we go to LA in January, we'll go, we'll take like the Sunday and we'll go up to like Malibu. And everybody's always like, why is there nobody in the water? Like, why is there nobody on the beach? It's like, dude, that water is freezing cold right it's now. The Pacific ocean. Yeah. yeah. The water in Vancouver is 60 degrees. The water in LA is 63 degrees. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah good, on, good on all those guys for, for surfing down oh, there. Yeah. Man, that's, that's not what you it's, think it is. Yeah. I mean, the only spot in the only spot in North America that's truly warm in January, February is, you know, Southern Florida. Yeah. Right. Yeah. California is, is you know, this, this winter, like it felt like Vancouver. Mm. Um, Apparently, apparently Los Angeles got more rain than Seattle this past winter. 
Really? Yeah, which is crazy. But that is crazy. but it is typically typical California is even if it's cooler, it's sunny and it's gorgeous and you yeah. Know, you don't well, hate, you don't uh, you don't hate anything when you're walking. I mean, outside. that's why I call you the world traveler because you know you've had the perspective of obviously going out west in Canada when you were young, yeah. and then coming back here. You've had your experiences here in Ontario, and then obviously traveling around with, you know, doing shows and stuff. But then obviously you know you moved on and and started doing stuff with uh, radio, and then that took you all over the place, which we'll get into. But. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've had a, a chance to live in in Vancouver for a while, a long while, and then yeah. go, you went. You were down in LA now for a long time as well. Three and, years, yeah. Yeah, and so you know, it's it's just interesting because you've also spent a little bit of like bouncing around, obviously in and out, but like some time in Nashville too, right? Yep, like just in and out. Yeah, I mean Nashville's. Uh, I, I love it there. I've I have spent a lot of time there. Typically, I was going. I mean, over the last fifteen years, it's. You know, three, four times a year. Yeah. We're there for sure. Which for some people, that's a lot. Like there's yeah. people that I know from this business that have never even been there. Yeah. And I, a friend of mine, shout out to Steve, uh, he just went there um, and, uh, you know, it was his first time and he's a huge, you know, guitar nut and and uh, me and him went to see the last Kiss show together. Um, saw and, the last one in Calgary. And, Not the very last one. But yeah, the, we, we saw the very the last, third one, last one. MSG. Or whatever it was, yeah. In New York. Then that was yeah. my first MSG show, actually. Nice. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it, but he just went down there. And I'm like, oh, dude, you're going to have such a good time. Yeah. Like, it, you know, because he's just into the whole culture and everything of, of, of it all, right? Yeah. And of course, you know, he went to the Gibson, you know, garage and all that stuff. And, and you know, being the guitar nut that he is. But it's it's like if you if you're in this business and you haven't been to Nashville, you have to, like, find a way, like, just find a way to get there just once. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and you may you may not be able to afford to go back or live there or whatever, but. There's some there's something extremely inspiring about being surrounded yeah. by every per like every person in that town. The person serving you coffee, the person that's it's that's pumping your gas. Like every person in that town, I think somebody said to me, every person in that town is a better songwriter than you. Yeah. And there's absolutely nothing like it anywhere in the world. No, it's crazy. And the other the other part of it is is it's got still has true like southern hospitality. So every person is amazing and incredibly talented and like doesn't feel like there's a drop of ego there at all and it, like, i yeah. really honestly hope it stays that way i really yeah. do because that's part of the charm i think yeah. of it all right yeah yeah i agree 100 percent. because i experienced i felt that when i was there you know yeah. like i mean i did the uh and lots of touristy people do this but you do the uh, grand Ole opry tour and we did the ryman tour as well but uh we did the grand Ole opry tour and, you know, I mean, this is a place where literally legends are like, you know, like huge artists go and do, do their thing. Right. But the people who there are just so humble, like everybody is just so hospitable and so humble. And it's, it doesn't matter, like you said, where you go yeah. in that town. It's just like that. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. I um, did a lot of stuff at radio with uh, uh, Carrie, who's the like the head like lead guitar player for the Opry house band. Oh, wow. And, you know, I didn't know him from a hole in the wall. And like the first time I showed up there, it was like I got welcomed with such open arms and shown every nook and cranny of the Opry. Oh, and that's like, so cool. you know, and, you know, I'm sitting front row for the show and just, you know, it's just immediately, immediately welcomed. And that's every experience I've had in Nashville, no matter how, how successful and how involved someone is with anything it's they are they're just happy to share and happy to bring you in so nashville and and and, and i i don't want to say this the wrong way nashville and and la i'm not yeah. going to say versus because that's not i don't want to do that yeah nashville and la are both i think just different right like they're just equally awesome equally you know cool and and sort of that sort of brings up like you know, what's, what's, how's the scene in LA versus sort of Nashville? Cause obviously we just talked about Nashville being like, <clears throat> you know, full on. Yeah. So first off, like Nashville, for people that don't realize, like it does, when you're in Nashville, it doesn't feel like it's any bigger than London. Like even when you're down on the, like in Broad on Broadway and stuff, like 
that's like Richmond Row in London. I mean, even, it doesn't yeah. feel like any bigger. Even there. the Gulch, like when I was in the Gulch, yep. and and like, man, it is such a cool, trendy sort of area that they built that up to be now. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. So it's like, it is a very small city by comparison to LA. Yeah, yeah, fair um, enough. Yeah. You know, and it is it is very music centric, like that downtown core, like picture Richmond Row in London, like picture every single one of those bars has a live band every night. Yeah. You know, that's that's Nashville. Um, L.A. has a ton of music going on, but it's very spread out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's still stuff like Sunset Strip. You know, the, the whiskey's still going. The Viper Room's still going. Roxy's still going. Um, and there's bands at those three spots every night. But then, like, that's, that's West Hollywood. You go into Hollywood, um, you've got, you know, the Palladium, which is a much bigger venue. Uh, uh, and you've got, you know, an, um, forgetting the name of the bar right now, but, uh, you know, another club there. And then you're going downtown LA for, for the rest of stuff, which, right. you know, is a 30 minute drive from Hollywood. Um, you know, ish. Ish. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> ish, could yeah. be an hour and a half, could be 15 minutes. Depends, <laughs> depends if you know the one way back streets. Yeah. <laughs> Done that before. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's a ton of music venues mm -hmm. in LA and there's a ton of music happening in LA. And for me, it's um, the, the rock and roll side of, of LA is, is what's really cool. And not that there's not rock and roll going on in Nashville. There is Nashville is not just a country. Oh town. no, absolutely. There's, there's everything, there's going on everything there. going on there, but yep. LA is truly everything. I mean, it's, but LA is 25 million people and Nashville's under a million probably. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, yeah. I mean, yeah. Nashville and area now, I think it's a little, a little over that, but yeah, yeah. it's no, there's no question. I mean, yeah. at, Los Angeles is is massive yeah there's just there's yeah. and it's like there's a lot going on all around it too right like there's all kinds of pockets of stuff too i would imagine that are happening in other towns that aren't even los angeles proper right totally like, yeah go out to the valley or go down in orange county and stuff like that yeah. yeah there's a lot of things and i mean even even vegas is only four hours away so it's even which like, is wild yeah like that's crazy yeah it's still a lot of stuff but you know one of the best la Nashville comparisons that I've said this to many people over the years. We used to do an event <clears throat> with uh, Vintage King um, in both Nashville and LA because they have they have locations in both both cities. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, it was Dave Pensado would come out, and you know, there'd be a whole lot of engineers and producers at both, and they'd have people talking and doing little cl clinics and seminars and. You know, it was just a like a ten till five, ten a.m. till five p.m. kind of deal, and there'd be you know beers and food and you know different manufacturers would have their stuff out, and it was just it was just a hang. It was a party. They called it a block party. That's um, cool. And you go to L.A. The event ended at five, five oh five, crickets, ghost town. Everyone had gone their different ways. Because they all had something more important to do. Sure. In Nashville, you're lucky if you get back to your hotel room at 5 a.m. Jeez. <laughs> wow. And that was just because the, the event ended and everyone hung out. And then it's like, well, what are we doing now? Well, let's go to my studio. Let's go to this studio. Let's go to this studio. So you just end up popping from place to place to place. Wow. And, you know, that's the community that a tight-knit music town has that L.A. just doesn't. L.A. is everyone's... You know, there is there's a lot of truth to the if you know you're if you're trying to be seen in LA and a lot of people are, are truly like that. Whereas Nashville, everyone's just like, Come on in. What are we doing now? What are we doing next? Yeah. So right. it's a lot of fun. I, I love Nashville. There's a part of me that would would love to live there and maybe one day. Um in another life for me, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> in another life for me. Exactly. I, I would love to. I, yeah. I mean, you know, but I obviously I got a couple of kids and they're young and my wife and her business is, wouldn't work. I know but, your dad always loved it too. Oh, it, uh, he tells, you know, there's a, there's definitely a couple handfuls of stories that he tells. Yeah. And that's one of them for sure. And that one is pretty close to the top of the list mm -hmm. where, you know, he loves telling the story of renting the RV and going down there and playing yeah. Uh, what was it called? 12th and Porter. Yeah. Um, and then he's got that story and he'll have that story forever. And, you know, Boris, who's here at London Guitars, um, you know, was in that band, uh, uh, Little Rock. 
Yeah. So was Darren Walters. He was on the show. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm really sad that project didn't go. I mean, it could have went. Uh, it really could have. And I'm listening to those tunes now, and I'm like, oh man. But yeah, he loved that town, and 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 he should he should go back. Uh, you know, I really wish he would go back and take my mom and just go and and check it out. I mean, it's it's very different now than when he went. Uh, it's changed a lot. <laughs> so he would, the, the, you know, whatever. 16, 17 years that I've been going, um, it's it's changed it's a lot. It's changed a lot. Yeah, and it's grown, and grown a lot. It's a cool town. People want to live cool in cool towns. Town. So Austin's the same way. It's like, yeah. you know, these these places that are awesome, they grow. Why? Because they're awesome. <laughs> and and they mature too, like, you know, in, in some senses. And, and the locals may not like it as much because it doesn't have as much of that charm uh, that it had maybe, you know, 30 years ago but uh, or 40 years ago. But it, it's it's still there. Yeah. You know, it's still there. There's pockets of it still there. But yeah, you know, Broadway is 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 from what I hear because I haven't been in a few years. But from what I hear, it's 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 celebrity bar after celebrity bar. But, you know, I mean, that's there's there's an opportunity there. I think I've talked to some people that say, you know what, it's giving a lot of opportunity for people to be seen in the business. Right. Like there's sure. there's a lot of gigging opportunity now with that, you know, multiple floors, running bands all day multiple places you know it's now the coin the the bachelorette capital of the world <laughs> you know so i mean but the good news is the women usually decide you know what band they want so at their yeah. wedding so there you go yeah um but well, you know it's it's cool. like it's cool like for music people you know it's yeah I mean, music row has been decimated and developed and you know there's only i think one studio left the, of the ogs yeah, but that's crazy. but you go to Berry Hill and that's the new music row and that's where everybody everybody who's everybody's got a studio now and blackbirds there and like yeah. a million guys it looks like a residential neighborhood but every one of the houses has been fully built out into a, into a studio I went, I went and did a studio tour and it freaked me right out because i was like we're in a subdivision like yeah. what's going on here yeah oh, i totally freaked yeah. me out but when you get inside it's like whoa okay yeah. Absolutely. Right yeah. on. And, um, you know, Bluebird's still there. And, you know, just like all of the kind of legendary stuff is still still happening there. So it's, I don't know, every, everywhere's grown. The population of the earth is like quadrupled in our lifetime. Right? Oh, so yeah. it's, 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 it's uh, you know, cool cities get bigger. Yeah. I think people gravitate to things that are cool, right? Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, that's just what it is. You know, they say that, you know, because we're like, you know, 90 plus percent water, you know, we generally gravitate towards water, right? As yeah. humans, right? We vibrate towards water, which is pretty cool. So this is why a lot of, if you look at civilization, a lot of us, a lot, a lot of the people in the world live near water. Well, I think it's the same thing with music, right? Music is the universal language of vibration. Sure. And I think it's the same thing, man. People, if they have the opportunity to, and this is why I say, you know, to people out there, find a way. Um, because you know, you may not think you need to go to Nashville, but you do, it'll fill your soul, man. And, yeah. and, and, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, when you get back from Nashville, maybe you can't live there, but it'll change you forever. And I think, you know, going to LA is the same, you yeah. know, I'm looking forward to going in January. We're going to go again. Um, and, uh, to hit up the NAMM show, it's been, it's been some years, but, uh, we're going to go again and it's, it's going to be a good time. I, I know it will. And, you know, we're going to hang out with a lot of like-minded people, but it's, it's, uh, it is different. You're right. You know, it is a different vibe there for sure. It's totally, it's, it's, it's just, it's huge. There's just so much going on. Um, but, uh, as far as the, uh, the sort of, so you, you know, you were in Nashville, you were in LA. Um, there's also Vancouver though, right? Yeah. So what's the Vancouver scene like versus the U S definitely again, very small. Um, um, but you know, you've got, uh, um, you've got some cool things still happening there and, you know, like, uh, a pedigree, you know, like the, you know, the Bon Jovi records and Aerosmith records. And of course, Brian Adams being from there and owning the warehouse studios there, there is still this like, like old time pedigree of things that happened there. Yeah. yeah. But you know, there's, there's a lot of cool bands still operating out of there hmm. um you know my my one of my best pals and my studio partner there is uh steve bays from hot hot heat hmm. 
and you know so they're out of there and he's had numerous other projects and you've got said the whale and dear rouge who are both you know big on canadian radio like dear rouge is killing it right now and their yep. new record yep. all over the place um you'll probably know and i i, I always forget his name because i don't know him personally but he's a, friends with a ton of my friends uh he's a dj guy he just did a takeover of the cn tower but he also did a, a sky train takeover as well oh uh who's that? we'll have to come back to that name yeah um, yeah, but you know, so there's there's stuff going on in that world too that I know nothing about, admittedly. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder that's who that my, is. That's I, I, I guarantee world. you, I know who it is yeah. for sure because I know that world yeah. inside and out. But you know, like um, there's um, Garth Richardson too, though. Right? Garth Richardson is there? there. Shout uh, out to Garth. Yeah, um, my my friend Ryan, who's a limb lifter and formerly Age of Electric. Yeah, um, um, that's going on. Um, Fake Shark got some pals in that band. Right, they're, they're doing really really well. Um, and, and like all, almost all of these bands, well, well, almost all of these bands are like really good friends. And then you've got, you know, the, the rock stars, Nickelback, of course, being, being Vancouver based. Most of those yeah. guys still live there. Yeah. my friend, Mike, he's in LA and all the other guys are in Vancouver though. We just hung um, out with them. Oh, uh, photo, uh, Jer of, uh, me and this guy, we just hung out with the Nickelback boys, uh, this summer. Yeah. Where is it? Yeah, there we go. I found one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's you and I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. I wow, found... how about that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I found one of us at yeah, Rock the cool. Park. But yeah, so <clears throat> anyway. Um... So yeah, there like there's, um, in like six six oh four records, which was was Chad Kruger and uh, 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 Jonathan Simkin. Um, like Thornley was on that label and all that stuff. And Carly Ray Jepsen's on that label. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. And, oh, wow. and now he's gone a lot of, uh, um, uh, a lot of country acts and stuff like that, but that makes but sense. Also rock stuff that's going on there. Um, so yeah, there's, I, I kind of, maybe cause I'm so attached to it. It feels like more stuff's happening there than even Toronto sometimes, but I, well, I know you were that's there for the a case. while. How long were you in Vancouver for? Oh, geez. Uh, you know, 16 17 years yeah so yeah. i mean at I mean, that point most you, of my adult life's been spent there for yeah sure so there you go so yeah. i mean you were you you intimately knew the scene yeah i mean that's just the reality yeah so these people are your friends you're hanging out you're going for beers you're chilling you're hanging out in their studios you're you're talking story everything yeah you know i mean it's a different yeah that that's you're living you, you've lived there for a lot like a lot that's a long time man. yeah yeah it's, you know? it's, it is still um, you know, I moved moved down to L.A. three years ago, but, um, um, you know, prior to that, it's many years and my third go at living there. I was living there twice when I was younger, but then once I went to OER, came here, was working for a while, then I got a job offer with with Is Technology and, and the Radar hard disk recorder um, yeah. to, to go, out to, go out to Vancouver. And it was like, well, I missed it a lot at that time. Um, so it was like, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to Vancouver and. That's yeah, right. That's what landed me back there. That's right. Yeah. And then you went on to do some stuff at radio. I do have just a quick photo, the Nam photo. Yep, that one. Yep. So this, I I bring this up because this is a legendary. That's a legendary photo. Yep. Um, this was Nam show. Uh, I think 2018. Yeah. Um. So I went to up to 2020 and then obviously pandemic times, whatever. Yep. But, um, yeah, that's a photo of, uh, of, of me, Aaron, uh, rock shoe, you, and, uh, the original founder, right? Peter, Peter. Peter Janice. And, uh, yeah. I call this a legendary photo because I think that was his last name. It was right. It was. Uh, and, uh, yeah. and, and at the time I didn't know that was happening. Yep. You told me afterwards. Yeah. Uh, when it all got announced that that was the, and for those of you that don't know, radio had gotten sold to uh, Ultimate Support. Is that? Well, is yeah, that, it was, a, wasn't Ultimate. It was the, the owner of Ultimate. The owner and, of Ultimate. And, and an investment group behind right, that. Right. Yeah. So, so to yeah. me, this was a legendary photo uh, with the crew as I knew it. Yep. And, and I say that because, you know, this was for those of you that don't realize, like, you know, obviously you just finished saying how long you've been in Vancouver. Yeah. I mean, 
I, I, one of the Nam things was, hey, let's go see Jay Porter. I yeah. mean, that was <laughs> for me. That was like yeah. a quintessential thing. And yeah. if you remember, I would always leave the radio booth till close to the end of close. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, it also, yeah, it was close to the end of close because we also had beers in the fridge. So there you go. Well, different. there was that. Yes. yes. Yeah. But, but yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that was NAM 2018. Yeah. Uh, we just announced at that show that we were being sold. So Peter, the founder, yeah, that's uh, right. had, had sold it off. And I mean, I mean, shoot, he was probably only around that day. Yeah. And then he, I know, he, yeah, it I got too, told me that. It, it got too hard for him. You know, he, yeah. he got a little, it got a little sentimental for him. So he, he went that if, I think the following day, he's like, guys, I'm not going to the show. I'm going to fly home early. Wow. And I think he was just, it was just too hard for him to, to talk. I'm about. really, I, I'm, yeah. there's some photos, industry photos that I have that I'm really excited yeah. about. That yeah. is absolutely one of them. Yeah. Hands down. Well, and then, sure. and, and Peter just passed away. Uh, yes last yeah. last month no i know yeah. i heard yeah or two months ago yeah um yeah, so know. yeah it was uh, uh yeah it's a, a little uh yeah little warm fuzzy feelings you know i know and there's yeah. i got another photo i don't have it up but i i have another photo like that that's was eddie shanker who was uh from jam industries which is a big canadian instrument distributor uh who passed away as well obviously a few years ago a number of years ago and uh, and uh, his his cousin, first cousin, Saul Fleischming, who uh, started oh, yeah. SF Marketing, which yeah. is another big distributor here in Canada. And I have a, f a random photo of the two of them with me at the MEAC show in Toronto that doesn't exist anywhere else because they were competitors, <laughs> but they were cousins, right? Right. I, I never knew that. Yeah. So yeah. I, I actually had that photo made in a, in a, in a canvas frame. Oh, cool. And it hangs in my office. Oh, right so these, these photos to me, you know, cause these people are like family, man. I mean, yeah. you're like family. I mean, these Peter was like family. These people are to me, we're like the music business. And you talked about it pretty elegantly with Nashville, you know, the, the music industry I don't even like calling it an industry. I like calling it you sort of like a community or, you know, I call my, my customers here at Music City Canada family members because really it's a family affair, really, this music industry, especially if you last in it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, especially if you go from mixing <laughs> monitors at Sunfest to now, right? <laughs> to traveling the world, to coming back here. But it's very small. Oh, Tony. That's the one thing like people don't, you know, anyone young getting into, it's like the biggest, biggest piece of advice to give is... Um, you know, be careful, be careful who you make enemies with, because that's, you know, it's too small of an industry to, to truly make enemies, you know, um, sometimes, sometimes it can't be avoided, but, uh, but at the most of the time, you know, you, you will be continue to run across the same people over and over and over again for your entire career. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's definitely, in my opinion, two degrees of separation. Yeah. And, and you don't even really realize it until you really start to get into it. Like once you, you know, once you start really getting out there, putting yourself out there harder, if you're a bit of an introvert or whatever, but if you, but if you really start getting out there and you really start meeting people and shaking hands, you really start to realize how small it is. Yeah. And the longer you're in it, the more that's confirmed. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> for sure. Um, and then, you know, something like the NAM show, you know, uh, hopefully it keeps rocking and rolling, but, um, uh, you know, that really makes you realize how small it is because all of a sudden, you know, you're in a room like, you know, shout outs to Yamaha for their awesome party that they used to do. And, you know, you go to the Yamaha Canadian party and it's like, you realize how many people know each other. It's like, yeah. Oh, you, Oh, you know, you know, Aaron, you know, so-and-so it's like, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Um, speaking of Nam show, uh, what's your, what's your, I mean, so for those people that don't realize, I mean, you spent a good number of years, obviously, with you had did some years at radio, radar and then radio mm -hmm. um, as a product uh, product development. Is that fair to say? What was it? Yeah, that? I was I was um, a product manager was my official title at radio, but you know, yeah. ultimately, in the last you know the last uh, you know six years that I was there, I was I was head of all product development. Okay, so I managed the engineering team and basically all ideas generated from my desk. And, and yeah. some amazing ideas for that matter. Um, but the question I have is sort of, you know, trade shows because yep. NAM obviously is in Anaheim, which is, you know, it's just outside LA, but yep. um, we talked about that a little bit, but you've been to obviously a good number of trade shows. 
We've just seen an insane time called the pandemic. Um, so now we're post pandemic. And mm -hmm. I, so I went to Nam. I flew down and went to Nam in 2020, right before the world went yep. crazy. Yep. Um, and I haven't been to a Nam since, but I did kind of didn't really want to go in April because I have a lot going on in April. It's a big birthday month for my family. Yep. Um, so it's, it's back in January now. Yep. Uh, I am planning on going, but what's your, what's your sort of take on trade shows, uh, in this sort of business and, <clears throat> and what's your perspective, I guess, two questions. So what's your perspective on it in general from having done so many of them mm -hmm. and the value of it all? And then sort of, where do you see it going? Um, Sure. Um, uh, someone, being Peter from Radial, yeah. told me once, and this is one one quote that I'll never forget. Peter was a real visionary. We butted heads on a lot of stuff, but I learned a lot from him. I worked direct, directly under the guy for twelve years, um, so, you know, so I know him very, very, very well. One of the things he said to me is like, you know. Uh, thing about marketing is a hundred percent. You spend, you spend a hundred dollars. Fifty dollars of it does nothing, and fifty dollars of it does everything. But the problem is, you never know which fifty dollars is mm. is doing the right thing. Right. So you know that could be said about magazine ads. It could be said about video production. It could be said about trade shows. Like, is can you can you uh, uh, put a return on trade shows? Probably not. But I think it's the number one most important networking thing that we've mm. got in our industry. And again, our industry being so small, the the hang factor is incredible. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. you know, think about it. Nam being in January, it's like, hey, it gets 90% of the continent out of a cold, grim environment. Gets them down to Southern California. Yep. And gets them forgetting about their day-to-day -day for a few days. Yep. And they get to see people that they've known in their peripheral or directly for years. And they just, I think it brings people back. In a lot of cases, brings them back refreshed and reju rejuvenated and actually ready to do stuff again. Absolutely. But, you know, like I, 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 I just went to, I went to AES in New York City last week. Oh, did you? Yeah. For, for two days. Nice. You know, I'm. But here in Ontario right now, I just hopped a quick hour flight down to New York and you know, I did it because I've been kind of, you know, enjoying a life of leisure a little bit over the summer. Yeah. yeah. I mean, not entirely true, but you know, I've been, <laughs> you know, I've been, I've been hanging at my cottage and, and trying to do stuff. And, and, uh, I was like, well, I'll go to New York just to see what's going on. Like it just gave me such a, a skip in my step of like being mm -hmm. able to hang out with industry people, seeing people I forgot I even knew all of a sudden it's like, Oh, Hey dude. Awesome. Good to see you. And, uh, uh, you know, that, that part of trade shows is what you can't quantify, No, no you know, sure. that, so I think I that, agree. I think it is important, you know, like, you know, the same thing with COVID that we were all, yeah, a lot of us could work, work remotely, we could do stuff, but the, the face-to-face -face interaction was what was missing. And sometimes I think trade shows is the only way we get that face-to-face -face with Life is, busy, Life yeah. is busy, man. Life is busy. And you, you know, when you commit to, you know, especially coming all the way from Canada, when you commit to getting on a plane and driving down to Toronto, Detroit, and parking your car in the middle of the snowstorm and getting on that plane and going down to LA or going wherever you're going, New York, yeah. or it's a commitment. Yeah. And you're, you know, when you get there, you're right. When you get there, you're like, okay, I'm, I'm out. I'm doing my thing. And yeah. You know, you kind of forget the rest of the world exists for a little while. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that because, you know, you're right. I think when when the pandemic was happening, uh, the former uh, president of NAM, uh, CEO of NAM, uh, did a did a, a, a live uh, little pod thing. Um, uh, and I was on there and I was uh, in a in a room with a bunch of people. And he was in there and he sort of said, you know, what do you guys think? You know, what do you think about NAM? And what do you think about the pandemic and, and it coming back? And is it going to come back? And sort of these were some of the questions being asked. And um, shout out to Jim Norris because it was Jim who was sort of moderating it. Um, and uh, it was, it, I sort of said, you know, I, I think, you know, the biggest thing that NAM had going for it 
it wasn't, you know, I mean, the product's cool and stuff. It really is just to go and touch the product, you know, before you have to buy it as a retailer is great. But that's not why we go. You nailed it on the head. Like we go because of the hang, mm -hmm. right? And that's exact, those exact words were what I used. I literally said, <laughs> it's all about the hang because it is, it, it's for me, that's what it's all about. And, you know, more business in a, in that way that Peter said, more business gets done at those hangs, you know, at the Yamaha party, at the Morton Steakhouse, at this random, you know, dinner that you got invited to at uh, some random restaurant, like whatever. Yeah. Or you're in the middle of an aisle and someone introduces you to someone and the next thing you know, you're, you know, you're, you're in someone's studio and you're, you know, like you're, oh. you're lifelong friends. So, I mean, I think that, that the hang is everything and at, at those types of things. And you're right. I mean, you can't, that can't, that's not done virtually. No. We're, we're, we're vibrating creatures that vibrate higher when we're together. It's just the way it is. It's yep. the science of it all. And so naturally, I think from my standpoint, I think they're, they're hugely valuable. Now, certain shows are going to come and go, I think. Yeah. Like, I mean, I AES, I, I mean, like, honestly, AES was always my favorite because it was small and it was super intimate and like the biggest engineers in the planet are roaming around. Yeah. You know, like, you know, I was hanging with Chuck Ainley the other day, like walking, walking through the aisles. That's and, cool. You know, there's just like, that is the nerdy side of audio that ha goes to AES, right? Like that's not the rock stars, that's the engineers and that's my jam. And, you know, and I know a lot of people that are like that. Uh, but, um, but that show has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. I mean, at one point with radio, I had a 40 foot booth at, at, at AES. And I mean, radio will never do AES again. Last time we did it was 2019 and we had a little 10 by 10 with a table and a banner. Right. Yeah. I you get know, that. and it was just cause the cost of it's insane. Yeah. And I don't, these, and I don't think people realize, Yeah, like you don't have to be specific, but like, What's the cost of being in a trade show like a NAM or an AES or any? I mean, all those are. Big, I mean, you know, this this, scale, this year at NAM was because this past January was back to full, full size, full pop. Um, you know, at radial, for example, I mean, we're flying twelve guys down from Canada, so that's twelve hotel rooms. Eesh. That's you know, that's seven days of breakfast, lunches, and dinners. Um, uh, uh, you know, all, all the like expenses on that, then booth, then, you know, uh, uh, tr trucking your stuff in and everything else. We were probably, probably close to half a million dollars to do that show. That's see, And when me, you get a big, crazy. you get a big company like Yamaha or something like that. I mean, they're going to be in the millions probably to do yeah. that show. Oh no, they are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's, it is insane. And, you know, in the trade shows, like we used to do Music Mesa in Frankfurt, Germany every year. And it was a very cool show. But it's a private organization that hosts it. NAM is at least, NAM's a non for profit, you know, center that all music retailers subscribe to, right? Yep. And, you know, so they're, they're doing it for the greater good of the industry. It's still expensive because you've got to pay union labor and all that sort of stuff at the mm -hmm. trade show to move your stuff around, but they're not profiting. Frankfurt was actual for profit. Like they don't care at all about the music industry. So it's like, you know, come, come and we're just making money off of you. And we stopped doing that show. And so did a lot of other people. Like, oh, really? Yeah. Like music mess is still going on, but the pro sound and light side of it, which was all the, the pro audio manufacturers, that show's done. Oh, wow. You know, they're out of business because they just got, got too greedy and they're charging too much money to do it. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, when, and hey, like times are tough. Again, you know, we're talking about the hang of it being a really cool thing, but it gets re really hard to justify. It was always oh, yeah. really hard for me to justify to the powers that be at, at radial to, like, it's still worth it, guys. Still worth it, guys. Like, the hang's what's important. And it's like, yeah, but we're spending, you know, when the not, when the dollar signs get to be that high, even you're like, oh, good, yeah. good God. So yeah. yeah, it's it's very expensive to do trade shows. Very, very, very expensive. And that's why I think every company in the world's just going. You know what? We can't do them all. 
we got no, sh- to gotta shrink it down. Nam, thankfully, is the big one. Um, yeah, and, and you know what? I'll be honest. I was, I was, I've been watching closely, and I think yep. a lot of people have, you know, yep. because obviously last year, you know, a couple of the big companies pulled out, and uh, you know, last couple of years, and they're back now. Yep. Um. So, so writing is kind of on the wall that it's back, and, and I think, and that's good. It's a good thing. Um, and we'll see. We'll see what kind of run it has. Uh. But uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, and this is with everything. I th- I don't think everybody can't buy a ticket to every concert. Everybody can't buy a ticket to every festival. Everybody can't go attend every every trade show. Yeah. So I think it's I think we're at a point where, yeah, people are are picking and choosing. Um, the 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 cream will rise to the top. You know, yeah. the best the best will 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 can will put, find a way to push on. Uh, and uh, you can't be greedy. No. Uh, industry's too small. Yeah. And everybody talks. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and everybody is, you know, regardless of, of public perception, everybody's grinding, man. In this business, it doesn't matter what level you're at. I mean, even if you're at the top, you're grinding to stay at the top. Sure. And they always say you never do, right? I mean, so you're always grinding and your staff is always grinding and you're you're always trying to innovate and you are looking at dollars and cents. And Peter's not wrong. I mean, you're going to spend the hundred bucks right? The 50 and 50, but it's, it's, it's gotta be somewhat calculated. (laughs) Like, like you can't just be spendthrift or you'll be out of business. Yeah. So I, I think that the, you know, support the trade shows and support the good trade shows and, and, and hang and, and it needs to be all about the hang and we're still supporting the trade shows. And, and I think it's a good thing. Um, Well, and so, you know, some of the, some of the best experiences I've ever had in this industry have happened at trade shows. And so, like, you know, we've mentioned stuff like, you know, spends and all that sort of stuff. That applies to me as manufacturer, you as a retailer. But, you know, just for people watching that are actual musicians or recording engineers or, you know, just hobbyists or whatever, like, like to go to those, the experiences you're going to have are like crazy. You know, even sitting in the Hilton bar outside of the trade show in Anaheim, the people you're going to just see and come across and might potentially have the chance to shake a hand with or take a photo with, like you're not going to oh. get there anywhere else. People have their guard let down so much. Like you're just going to walk into a booth and then Stevie Wonder could walk in, you yep. know, like yep. I've seen it a million times. I've seen Slash Earth- and Steve Lukather with their arms around one another walking down the hallway. I was, you know? I was literally <laughs> walking by a booth and Earth, Wind and Fire was playing you know, it was a small booth. It yeah. was like 10 by 20 or something. It was tiny. And um, one of the guys from the band started and went in there and started playing one of the bass guitars or one of the guitars. And then the whole band ended up there. Not, I don't know if it was the whole band, but a good number of the band ended up in the booth playing. And there's this crowd that starts forming. But I was just, I was walking by before that even happened. Yeah. And, and that stuff happens there. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, Lee Sklar, I was walking, you know, I was literally walking, uh, up the main road. Uh, and there was, that was when they had the stage in the middle of the road and I, I still was, do. and I was walking, I was walking up the main road and on the sidewalk. And it was like, you know, you remember, it was like, it was literally like, you know, two people could maybe go side by side, right on the sidewalk. And I'm walking up. And the next thing I know, I'm literally rubbing shoulders with Lee Sklar. And I'm like, Oh, wow. Like the last time I saw you, you were playing bass on stage for Phil Collins, Um, you know, and so it was it was awesome. And he took he took a photo with me. He was so awesome. And but yeah, I think and and I watch a ton of his podcast stuff during the pandemic, too. But yeah, uh, I think it's a really interesting. Those shows are interesting because you get the opportunities to, to hang with your kind of people and uh you know as long as you're willing to put yourself out there and and network and smile and be genuine you know um yeah man it is a cool cool experience um that being said as far as like you know that's sort of like the uh the trade show world um i know that you know sort of one of the things that we wanted to touch on was like the studio world so mm-hmm. the studio world um you've spent obviously a, a, a while now doing studios mm-hmm. waterline being the first apparently uh-huh. um which we're, we're proud of that uh and so you went on to do and jerry you can pull up the studio photos 
uh, you went on to do a bunch of different studios, <clears throat> right? We got some photos of different uh, different studios. Yeah. So um, when I first so what's, what's... when I first started with Radial, I was in charge of all the Prime Acoustic stuff, which mm. is uh, one of their sub brands. Um, and so I inevitably ended up doing a lot of uh, a lot of room design stuff for uh, acoustic treatment. Um, so all the all the soft squishy stuff put on walls and all the bass traps. So the if you go back, uh, um, go back a couple more. So that's that was Butch Walker's room, his first one that I did. Uh, that's my space. Uh, that you just that one. Um, wow. So that's 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 awesome. That's Tugboat Studios in Vancouver. So that's Steve Bays and I. Uh, that's been our room for the last uh, six years. So I still have that. Even though I've been in LA, I'm, I'm coming back to that room. Um, nice. Yeah. Uh, that was us with probably get to that in another time, but, um, we did this last said the whale record. So that was just kind of our, one of our in session photos. Okay. Yeah. That's, um, what do we got here? All right. This one is done for Jakir King. Um, Nashville based guy, um, one of his very well known for the Kings of Leon records, but also worked with a ton of other people. Look him up. Jakir is one of the most well known uh, uh, recording engineers right now. Also, the biggest spokesperson for Universal Audio. Oh, uh, wow. Does all of their, like, a lot of their their uh, marketing t tutorials yeah, and I stuff. I see a pile of it there in the, in the rocks. Yeah. Yeah. But wow. uh, yeah, so he outfitted a, this is one of these. Nashville Studios that was a house that's now has a, a house built within the house for all the studio rooms. Right. Um, this was Keb Mo, um, very well known blues musicians. Yeah. Worked on a lot of stuff. I think you did like a lot of stuff like Bonnie Raitt and stuff. Don't don't quote me on that, but uh, I helped them with this design. This was uh, featured in Mix Magazine um, when we did that. Yeah, you just turned me on to him uh, today. I, I was like, oh, who's Cat Moe? And, and then we were listening to some of his tracks earlier. And yeah. Man, because uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of blues, right? My dad yeah. did the Blues Fest for a few years. And yeah. He's, awesome. uh, yeah, when you when you start looking into his credits, you'll see he's been involved with a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. that's really cool, yeah. man. Um, this is uh, Tommy Lee's room. Um, this is quite no a big, No big deal. Who's, the, who's that guy? <laughs> no idea. <laughs> Hank, one cool. one hit wonder. Yeah, right. <laughs> Dude, that's awesome. Uh, so this was his house in Calabasas um, that we did this this whole space. There's another one of the control rooms somewhere in these in these photos. There it is, there big SSL room. Uh, I think he sold this house. I think this this house was featured on one of those TV shows, like Cribs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they did the walk did the walk around and all that kind of stuff. That's but, awesome. Um, uh, yeah, I, I did did most of the design with his engineer, uh, Chris Baseford, who's also an Ontario guy. Oh, really? Um, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's cool. Um, Chris, Chris, his most recent thing was just uh, he did all the, the last Nickelback record. Um, but mm -hmm. prior to that, he was he was Tommy's full time engineer. So him and I did most of the design on this room to working together. Um, and then, uh, then I got to go down there and actually hang with those guys in, in the room for a day and, uh, and check it all out, which was, which was really cool. That's sweet. Um, that's, that's my studio partner, Steve and I, when we were doing the said the whale record, uh, we went into, that was, uh, do, 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 trying to think of the studio name in Vancouver. We worked in a couple, and I can't remember that one oh, right now. No. That's the old. Um, uh, just did a documentary. Um, it'll come to you. It'll come to me. It's one of those anyway, things. Pull up the Tommy Lee picture. There we go. There he yeah, is. Yeah, so that was when I went to to see the Tommy Lee room when I was there. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's a, he's a cool cat, man. Yeah, I mean that's two thousand and eight, I think, when I did that. Yeah. So it's a long time ago now. Dude, yeah. time is flying, man. Yeah. yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, I mean, you know what? It's funny because even we talk about that Nam picture with Peter being twenty eighteen. Yeah, like even that's a while ago now. But then you talk about two thousand eight. That's ten years before that. Yeah, yeah, it's freaking wild. me right out, man. It's wild. Um.
So traveling with radio and tra just do all your travels. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that uh, I want to touch on is relationships. So we talk about the hang at trade shows and stuff like that and building up relationships. But then, you know, you leave and you go home and yeah. And you've obviously built relationships because you said you were in Vancouver for a while mm -hmm. and you built relationships there, but then you were here for a while and you kind of come in and out, especially with your cottage and everything. And, uh, and then, you know, LA and Nashville and, and, and everywhere in between. So relationships with partners, friends, family, all of it. What does that look like when it's, you're moving it, around like that? It's tough. <laughs> yeah, I would think. It's tough. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the, uh, you know, for, I was with Radio for 17 and a half years. Right. And, you know, out of that 17 and a half years, roughly half of my year was traveling almost every year. Yeah. And, you know, I'm like, I've been to 38 countries. I've, you know, I've, like on the road and some of that's planned, but some of it comes up very quickly. Yeah. Right. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good at, you know, keeping in touch with people, uh, relationships get tired, you know, it's very cool to begin with, but then it's like, <laughs> Oh, I'm going away again. And it's a like, what again? again? So that, that, that's tough. You know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't have, I don't have kids. Um, Thankfully, because this would be impossible, I yeah. think, in, in that case. Like, you know, you've got two little ones at home. If you were having to be yeah. away two weeks a month, oh, you know. Yeah. And That's... I know a lot of people that, you know, came off the road because they didn't want to raise their kids over, you know, uh, over FaceTime or whatever. My dad did it. Yeah. My dad did sure. it in the 80s. Yeah. I mean, that's why this place exists is because my dad, he told me all he ever wanted to be was a bass player in a band. Yeah. And he built the original company and then, and then PA shop. Uh, because it was a, it was a necessity to survive. Yeah. Because he he couldn't be a bass player in a band because he got home after playing a, you know a string of gigs after you know a couple of month or two, came home and I had grown like a foot and a half. Yeah. And it freaked him right out, so he came off the road. So I I, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I know pals that do it, and I don't know how they do it, um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it's it's. It's challenging on one level, but it's also very cool to know that I have friends in like 50 cities. Sure. You know, like that's that's a pretty rad experience. It's like, oh, I want to go to Vienna, Austria tomorrow. I got a pal I can stay with. You know, London, England, yes. Amsterdam, yes. You know, Belgium, yes. Like all of these spots. It's Australia, uh, Asia, you know, just all these places I've been. And I, and I have friends in those spots. So it is very cool. Like you're your 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 network of pals grows exponentially when when you do stuff like this sure and you know like like when when you know 2020 march whatever 15th of 2020 when the world shut down like like that was really hard for me i just came off like one of my craziest travel years ever i think i was in like i was in europe twice australia and asia all in the course of 2019 and 2020 hit, and even I was starting off with a bang. I was in, um, was at Nam, came home for a few days. No, yeah, came home for a few days. Went to Revelstoke snowboarding, uh, mm. then flew back to Vancouver for like two nights. Went to Amsterdam wow. uh, for the ISE trade show. Flew home for a few days, and then went to my uncle's place in Mexico. So a couple of personal trips in there, but it was just like, you know, I was in uh, 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 the U.S., Netherlands, and Can a ski trip in Canada and in Mexico all in the first two months of the year. So I was just keeping up that momentum. I mean, the year before I, before I flew 120,000 miles. And, uh, and so I was keeping that up for 2020. And all of a sudden I was grounded. Ugh. And I'm like, I know. I didn't know what to do with myself. It was like a really tough few weeks of like well i'm bored i don't have a trip booked like what the heck's going on <laughs> <laughs> and jay and, takes the hat off i don't know <laughs> hang this up for a little so while. yeah like it was it was really um it was really a tough a tough little little go of it and then you know and then i started to like develop a routine and you know 
got got back into the workout regimen and you know nice. started cooking meals for myself and a little healthier living and you know and life was pretty good but um you know when when it did start back up again it was like i mean it's never fully started back up for me i mean i went down to la kind of you know almost mid pandemic um and have been there ever since was but i was still like i still get itchy if i'm not on a plane every couple of weeks right and i still do that i mean even here i've been based at my cottage for the summer and i've still been every couple of weeks i'm in vancouver or i'm in la i'm like making sure that i'm yeah you know, not only for my own sanity, but it also does kind of keep up friendships and relationships in those places too. Absolutely, and yeah. and keeps things th- keeps you connected, keeps things yep. relevant too. I'm sure. Yep. You know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I think it's interesting. Like you know, I I I spent some time on the road with a couple of bands, and you know, I know why the bands will bring their kids and their wives with them. Right. It can be it can be rough. Like it can be hard. Yeah. Um, you know, I can't imagine how it is for the little little the young people, right? Like young people who aren't even barely out of high school, you know, if they even are, uh, who are who are the actual artists, right? Like like yeah. trying to learn schooling and life on the road uh is crazy and not having your friends and, and you know, just you're gone and you're you know, it's it's crazy. Oh, and we've seen it happen, you know, with like Bieber. Yeah. And like Sean Mendez. Yeah. And like those those kids that made it so big so early and, you know, kind of had some crazy times. They got a lot of tattoos of for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, like, you know, sometimes you you hear of, you know, Bieber's case, you know, all the debauchery he got himself up to is well documented. Yep. Um, you know, but then there's like someone like like Mendez who, you know, just like. I'm sure the reason he just canceled tours and kind of disappeared for a while is for the same reason. It's like, it's, it's got to, yeah, it's got to be super tough for, yeah. for those, you know, that, that level of just hopping on and going. I mean, you know, a lot of people are like, again, going back to what I mentioned, there's a lot of people who think it's very glamorous until, until they're caught up in it. You know, and I, there's a lot of, a lot of my travel has been glamorous. I'm not going to discount that for a second. Yeah. What's different? I've stayed right? in some nice hotels and I've eaten some nice meals and I've done some really cool stuff that most people will never, ever get to do. Sure. Um, but there's also been a lot of times where I'm away for two weeks and it's just hotel room after hotel room. And you're at one o'clock in the morning and you're putting your key in a door going, why isn't this working? Why isn't this working? You realize you're, you're at your room number from last night. <laughs> and you know it all looks the same it doesn't matter where you are you just landed in a place and you're Bam. staying at another you know another marriott somewhere else in the in the world and yeah and that's it part of it looks the same that's part of it yeah. you know and and you know let's touch on that you know that the touring world is you know the touring world is a different world and i and i think that the 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 behind the scenes of that can be interesting i mean the you know you're right i mean it's you know, there is definitely a point where it all sort of blends together and uh, you really have to like the people you're out there with yeah. uh, because, you know, that's that's your family now. Yeah. And, you know, I joke with the guys who I work here with because, you know, although we're not on the road, it's like I spend more time with the people in this building than I do with my own wife, sure. which is crazy, but it's true. Because, you know, um, I might see my wife for an hour in the morning if I'm lucky, half hour, maybe an hour. And then I see her at night for maybe an hour, two hours. So three hours a day. And then I see her on the weekends. But when you add it all up, I'm hanging out with these people longer. Yep. And and that's just, it's, it's no different. It's even more extreme on the road and the touring world. So I, I know, like I say, I know why certain acts will bring their significant others and or, you know, um, families on the road with them uh sometimes they don't uh if it's short runs things like that they won't um and it depends you know if they're in the early stages of their career and there's debauchery and craziness going on then they won't either yeah but uh because they don't want to expose them to that but it's uh i think that you know the touring world now is especially post pandemic i think it's it's really different i mean first of all i've talked to some people you know dare i had darren walters on the show and Darren doesn't tour big rock bands. He tours, you know, theater acts and stuff like that. But, you know, he was saying that, you know, the cost of touring has gone way up. Oh, yeah. Right? So, and it, that's, again, goes back to my comment earlier about you can't do everything. 
you know, and it's, it would be the same with that. Like, you know, um, touring has gotten a little more challenging. You're still going to find a way. I mean, you know, there's still bands that are going to, you know, knuckle down and get in a van, <laughs> but you guys and get on the road and, you know, but, uh, it's, it's different now, I think. Yeah. I, I think well, it's, it's different. It's, I mean, first, you know, there's the numerous thoughts that have popped in my head while, while you were speaking there. Um, you, first of all, like I, I was faced with a choice when I worked here, you know, the, you know, the trajectory for me working at the PA shop in 2003, 2004, 2005 was keep doing what I'm doing here or go on the road, which is really what most people who have come through here working live sound, they end up doing, right? That's right. Yeah. And I looked at it going, I don't know if I want to go on the road. And, and for a variety of reasons, because you don't start at, you don't start mixing the stones. Nope. You know, so you're you starting out with like, you know, C and D level bands. So you're a bunch of stinky dudes in a van driving from place to place to place. If you're lucky, you get a shitty hotel room. If you're most of the time, you're, you know, you're just what the sleep you get in the van on the way to the gig or maybe mm -hmm. in the parking garage while you're there. That's, that's where you get to rest. And furthermore, back then I was looking at the dudes who the road dogs back then who were my age now. Yeah. And I'm looking at these guys and they're most of them are still out there. Uh, a lot of them, a lot of them have been retired too. Yeah. There's a, yeah, that's true. There's you know, there. um, you know, overweight, chain smoking, over drinking, you know, kids with three different moms, like obviously I'm exaggerating, but not really, you know, there was a lot of, I, I looked at these guys who I was learning a lot from on the technical side, but I was just looking at the lifestyle that they led. And I'm like, I don't want that to be me when I'm that age. And so that's when I made the decision to hop over to the industry side. Now, it's hilarious because I've ended up being a lot of time on the road as well, but it's been a lot better living on the road than what most of those guys do when they're, sure. when they're traveling. And now it's funny when I look at guys like, um, like our pals, Adrian and Nathan, who both, both worked here, yep. um, you know, after me, uh, and those guys are out there on the road now. And it's like, you know, guys that came up in my generation probably went to school for it. And we took a bit better care of ourselves and, you know, they're, yep. they're now of they an did. age where it's like, yeah, they don't, they don't look like, you know, they don't look like they've been beaten up and put away wet. They've, they've taken better care of themselves on the road and they take better care of their ears so they can keep doing this. They've got longevity yep. in the, in the, in the game. Well, they um, get, get smarter. Yeah. Right? So it's, it's not as get much smarter. of a, it's not a much of a, uh, you know, a, uh, you know, shady tree mechanic or, or, you know, kind of, kind of gig anymore. It's like, no, it's pro now. Like guys, yeah. guys know what they're doing. So it's not as bad, but so yeah, there's that side of the, the touring world that, um, that why I didn't want to be a part of it back then and, and it being different now, but now with how much stuff has started to cost, um, touring to that point to that point you were you were alluding to um there's a reason why you're paying 200 300 400 dollars for concert tickets and it's not just because the artist wants to get rich mm -hmm. everything has just gone up dramatically oh gosh yeah. you know and it's like and, and of course you know it's the audience expectations is a part of it like you don't want to just go to a show you're not going to be able to get away with going to play an arena with no like crazy lighting pyro all that sort of stuff yeah anymore. video walls yeah, yeah you know like you have an expectation when you go to a show that's going to be amazing um and that costs a lot of money and trucks on the road and buses on the road and hotel rooms and all of that stuff even just the crew have, like, like it's all tripled and quadrupled crew. in price it's like, oh yeah it's it's become insanely expensive so when i see a concert ticket for a huge price it's like i get it I completely get it. Now, of there, of course, there are people probably making way more money than they ever did too. But, um, but there is a reason why the costs costs have gone up exponentially. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And which also means that uh, you see a lot of canceled tours 
Mm-hmm. And I don't care what anyone mm-hmm. says. The canceled tours are because they couldn't sell enough tickets to justify it. That's it. There's, there's, there's they can say any excuse they want to say, but that's what's going on. Like they, they know that they need to sell ninety percent of the venue out before they even put wheels to the pavement to even make a go of it. And if if ta- if ticket sales aren't aren't showing in that level, um, they're not going to be able to do it, which is a damn shame because. You know, I would love to go see Taylor Swift, but I don't also don't want Taylor Swift to be the only artist that's touring or people of her level. Well, this is it. You know, I had a couple of opportunities like that where I bought tickets and, you know, uh, it didn't happen. Now, you know, one of them was that for sure. And, you know, the other one wasn't. The other one was uh, Aerosmith, mm. um, you know, blew out his voice. Right. Yeah. And yeah, health issues on older bands. Well, this is it. And, and and I've been, you know, I've been on the train of the of the last tour, you know, the last tour train, right? Where, you know, I went to the Eagles supposed last tour, which I don't know if I believe that because they're at Sphere right now. But anyway, um, uh, you know, Kiss, um, I did was going to do the Aerosmith one, you know, so I'm on these sort of last tour uh, binges. And, you know, because there's people like Kiss who I was never a massive fan of, but I always wanted to see them. You know, I'm a huge fan of the of a few of the songs and the production. Same. And, and wasn't it so worth it? Oh, like 100%. Same. I'm the exact same way as you. It's yeah. like, you know what? Like, I never loved Kiss at all, but it's like, I'm a rock and roll guy. I need, oh, to, go, yeah. I need no. to go see them on this last tour. You ha- yeah. And absolutely. I was hanging out with my friend in, in, in Calgary, and we were, I was there for Shania. And because mm. I know know a couple of the guys in Shania's band, and so I flew in, and her and I were going to go to the Shania show, and we did, and you know got to got to see the whole rig and all that sort of stuff, and I'm like Kiss is playing tomorrow night, I'm like I got to try to get tickets, and like at like ten in the morning the next day, and yeah, little industry secret. 10 in the mornings when they release all the tickets that's being held back for the band. So you can always get tickets. To the, <laughs> you always get tickets to the day of the show. Don't, don't go pay double the price or whatever on, uh, on, uh, on StubHub or anything like that. Um, so I'm like, yeah. And I got, you know, tickets for kiss, uh, like third row from Jesus. the stage, uh, at Saddle Dome in Calgary. That's awesome. And it was like, I spent the whole show laughing my ass off. It was just, it was the, the best and funniest and most entertaining thing in the world. Well, like, that's those guys know how to do it. Like that's that, what it that is. That is a show. And you, and you know what's funny about that comment is when we left there. So you know, I got a picture of this. We'd spent it was my, my buddy Steve's first time in New York. So we did all the touristy stuff. Yeah. And my app on my phone said we walked like. 40 kilometers. I'm not even exaggerating. Okay. By day three, we'd walk 40 kilometers. Anyway. So we're at a, we're at the Mm -hmm. MSG show. We see the show. It was unbelievable. And we're leaving the show and, uh, we're on our way back. And Steve goes, you know, what's interesting. He goes, uh, there's never going to be a band like kiss again. And you know what? He's right. It, the things that that ba- like and they do they, they, and obviously it's their last ever show right yep. so they went all out but it was you know to do that much pyro the you know all of the all of the you know moving pieces that they have in the show that where they're you know coming out and it just everything the moving stages and like, there's a lot you know you and i both know from a production standpoint there's a lot going on there oh yeah Right, <laughs> I mean, that's ex- you want to talk about costs. That has a lot of dollars going. You want to talk about there. costs. I mean, so to me, you know, it, if it's hard enough to just sell, you know, a regular arena tour with a video wall and and you know a lighting rig and a sound rig and and a few buses on the road, good luck trying to reproduce that. I mean, and, and, and justifying it. That's like you going back to radio and Peter again, going, Hey guys, we got to do that trade show again. Yeah. It's like trying to go to that extent production wise on the road. It's tough, man. I mean, I'm interested to see what the U2 guys do going forward. I'm going to the Coldplay show coming up that just like cool. literally was insane. Uh, that's happening in Toronto. Yeah. Um, you know, talk about people who are constantly like raising the bar. Right. Um, 
And then there's the, kind of the flip side of that too, right? Like we went to see the Eagles in Detroit. Uh, I went with my dad. And, uh, you know, that was a really emotionally moving show for him. And he just walked away from that. He posted it on social media where he s literally said, uh, I just, that's the best show I'm ever going to see. Uh, I'll never see another show mm -hmm. like that again. And his reasoning for, because I asked him after he posted that, why? And he said that his reason was uh, uh, because, you know, it's hard enough to get, you know, two guitar players to play and sing in a band. He's like, six is another thing altogether. Right. You know, probably not going to see that again. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, good on the on the, the you know, uh, Vince Gill and and uh, and all the guys from the Eagles for doing what they're doing, because it's it was an unbelievable show and the production sure. was unbelievable. But that's a different thing. Right. They got an incredible amount of hits. They're all incredibly seasoned musicians in their own right. They can all still sing. They can all still play. It, it, it's just every piece of that show is, is polished. Right. Whereas, like you said, the Kiss thing is entertainment at yeah. its finest yeah. with the music, right? Yeah. Like the music is the soundtrack of the of the whole thing, right? And so, yeah, the hits, you know, that, that Kiss had, you know, it, it makes, obviously makes the show, but, uh, but the show itself is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and yeah, from a production standpoint, I don't know if we'll see that again like that. You know, it's, it's a... Uh, it's it's pushing the mark man i mean it's, it really was and and i'm really you're right i'm really happy i went i yeah. i'm really happy i went to go see it from a number of standpoints uh but to just be able to say that hey i went and saw the last kiss tour and yeah. you know there will be people 20 years from now they'll be watching videos of that band going you know just like just like people now are watching videos of the doors you know mm -hmm. and being inspired by the doors in terms of their music and and all the stuff that they did <clears throat> you know and but you know the stuff that because we're we're headed into a more crucial entertainment world i think right like we're 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 you know and we can touch on it i guess a bit you know we're dawning on this whole ai thing right and i think that the relevance of performance is going to be paramount yeah the ability to to emotionally physically energetically connect with people is going to become the single most powerful thing you can do as an artist because it's, it's something that AI will never be able to replicate. Exactly. Yeah. And why we do the hangs at trade shows and why we buy the concert tickets, even yeah. though they're an insane amount of money relative to 20 years ago or 10 years ago, but we do it because it's, it's the thing that you can't, you can't replicate with mm -hmm. a computer. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and so I, I think that's super important. And uh, so not to say that production won't continue and big shows won't happen, but not not the way Kiss did it. No, and like, like you know, I think like everything right now, we're in such a um, post-pandemic post heyday of, you know, people will spend all this money to go to shows. But man, oh man, it's getting so expensive that people are really going to have to pick and choose what they go to going yeah. forward. Festivals, so do. it's it's going to be yeah. Festivals are crazy, and there's so many things, you know. And in L, like being in LA for the last three years, it's like every day of the week I go out and see something. Yeah, right. And at a certain point, you know, I'm lucky. I worked, you know, with with radial and the amount of time I spent there, and everybody on the planet uses radial stuff. I get guest listed to most things that I want to go to, but even that's getting harder and harder because the seat is worth four hundred dollars. They don't want to give more. they don't want to give it away as a guest list anymore. Third row is like a thousand bucks yeah. now, man. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, remember, so you and I went to U two in what two thousand and four. Yeah. At uh, in Toronto. Yeah. Pop Mart. Yeah, and like that was like the. I remember I was like, I'm not paying for that ticket. And you called me up and he's like, we're going, you owe me 200 bucks. I'm like, 200 bucks, are you crazy? <laughs> but U2 was the most expensive band forever. Like that was the most expensive show well, you could go to. Well, it was production. Absolutely, it was production. We understood Do you that. Do you remember that oh, show? it was so cool. I, I, mean, I, I didn't realize it at the time when we were there, but afterwards, I remember watching the documentary they made where that was one of the first video walls. Yeah. And, and they had riggers 
behind the screen for no, you guys that weren't around back then, they had riggers behind the screen on pulley systems that would go up and literally pull out uh, LED modules and shove new ones in because they would be burning out constantly up and down yeah. the walls <laughs> during the show. Yeah, It was crazy yeah. that th what they were doing back then. But that was Wiley Williams. That was their their guy, right? And yeah. he, he did a lot of their stuff. And, and at the time, you know, I didn't know a lot about uh, some of that stuff, but I was learning quickly because that was right around the time that I was really, you know, getting into that whole lighting world. And well, I had, and it was a, it, like, I mean, but the production U was U2's crazy. like, U2's like Mercedes, you know, what U2 does on tour is going to start showing up on everybody's tour five years down the road. Yeah. Road. And it, and it does. And like what Mercedes puts in their cars now is going to be on a Toyota in five years. It's the same, They're like the, the new school deal. Genesis. Like yeah. I, I look at some of the stuff that Phil Collins and Genesis did back in the in the seventies and eighties. Yeah, and it's the same thing. Like yeah. they were the guys that helped to fund MIDI yeah. and helped to invent the moving head, yeah. right? And then you two kind of towards the nineties and two thousands took that reign over, and you're one hundred percent right. And and went and did insane, insane that claw stage, like insane stuff. Yeah. Right. So, but you know, again back down to reality where's the claw now now it's a shopping mall i think somewhere but it's you know you 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 can't just keep going up like eventually no. things have to level off and and we're there right now i think we're there and i think you're right i think there's going to be a bit of a correction where people have to choose so choose wisely would be yeah. my thing yeah and i think you know there's live touring is the only way bands make money and i mean we saw it at radial the you know 2020, 2021, even part of 2022, um, you know, our music instrument stuff sold like crazy <clears throat> um, because everybody was stuck at home and everybody was spending money. And I'm sure you saw that, yep. that here. Yep. And then one day, all of a sudden it stopped. Mm -hmm. But that day it stopped is when live touring picked up. Yep. And like, so, you know, that live touring is paid me for the last 20 years the better part of it because that industry is very very good and it's also paid most of my friends because that's very very good and you know the other side of your business is pa shop productions yep sure that's been very very good the last two years right yeah absolutely. and so there's a ton of good concerts going on um i think people have to be smarter pro touring has to be done more wisely again because what i said earlier it's like we don't want to just see the Taylor Swifts of the world out there. Um, we want to see the the smaller bands still be able to make a viable go of it. Sure, um, yeah, absolutely. And you know, so far so far it's good. And you know, there's I I do have optimism in a lot of ways because like seeing what's going on in L.A. right now, there's a lot of rock and roll bands in L.A. Perfect. From we need it, man. You know, and these are these are young people playing in these rock and roll bands, and every bar has got that stuff going on. So there mm. seems to be a bit more of a grassroots resurgence going on, and hopefully that means you Perfect. know a little bit more stripped back tours and stuff that's playing back playing. That's okay. You know, you know, we like I said we did. You guys did Nickelback at Rock Park, and we were we were hanging out with those guys a couple months ago. Nickelback's tour is just wrapped up. I think it was one of their most successful tours ever. So Rock hey, Park was the smallest venue. Th their smallest venue. Yeah. yeah, they stripped it back because I saw the same show in L.A. And, you know, the the uh, the, py the pyro wall behind them was, you know, double the length in L.A. and all yeah. that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. They left a lot of trucks behind. Yeah. Um, but they've also stripped back their show from years ago. So sure. they're doing a bigger tour, doing bigger numbers, but they've you know, they've reduced the size, so they're able to make it more viable. Video like, walls helped a lot with that, yeah. technology-wise. Yep. Um, what you can do now with video wall uh, is is pretty cool. I went and seen uh, Billy Idol. Speaking of, oh, cool. you know, tu tours that you got to go see before they're gone. I know. I He's went still on my list. I went to go see <laughs> Billy, and man, I'll tell you, kudos to whoever did his video content, because... It was that good that, I mean, I'm an industry person, but if you're sitting in the crowd and you're far enough back and you don't realize that's a video wall, you're like, I mean, you obviously, you're going to realize eventually, but it's, 
it it looks like it's it's like it's like a set piece. It's like a it's like whoever thought that through was like, wow, we're gonna do this like a theater show. Like this is gonna these this is gonna look like he's in you know a haunted house thing. You know whatever it is, whatever the theme of the song is, and stuff's moving but slowly and. You know, it's, it, it was, it was, it wasn't like that traditional sort of flashy, you know, uh, video wall that you knew it looked like a big TV. It wasn't that at all. It was, it was like a moving set piece and it was really well done. It was tasteful. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I think that that's changed the game big time uh, for being able to pack less production in a small and less, lesser amount of trucks and give still give people that wow factor yeah you know uh yeah. and so that's great and and you know so as you mentioned with pa shop productions we're doing that all the time you know the the video walls seem to get bigger and wider and more defined as we go and and it's because you know that's that's just the thing you got to figure out a way to 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 make that production those numbers make sense mm -hmm. um and that's a way to do it um for sure and yep. and the technology with line arrays too is is gotten a tons better, way better, way better, right? Way better. I mean, can you imagine the PAs that we used to stack up back in the nineties? You know, having to cover some of these rooms like it's not going to happen. Well, the on on that note, one of the cool things, um, you know, there's a couple like Live Nation venues in LA um, that were built in the last few years. Yep. Uh, one in Anaheim, the, it's the new Hard Rock in Anaheim. I don't know if you ever went to the old one in downtown Disney. Yeah, yeah. But now they have a new one, which is like where uh, closer to the convention center. It's off of Disney property now. Oh, I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, and it's uh, really? you know where all like the really nice restaurants are. Yeah, um, yeah like yeah. it's in and that's kind of like that open air plaza kind of thing. Yeah, Hard Rock's in there now. Oh, wow. And it's the Live Nation redesign. And have you been to History in Toronto? Yes, I haven't, but that's a Live Nation redesigned yes. as well yeah venues that are designed acoustically perfect which i appreciate designing studios for as long as i did mm -hmm. um with modern line array technology and you get to walk in these places and the sight lines are good everywhere doesn't matter where you stand it's and awesome. if you're five feet tall you can still see the band um and you can listen to an entire show without earplugs yeah, and your ears aren't ringing when you leave the, the because now ninety dB sounds loud, whereas before ninety mm. dB didn't sound loud enough. Yeah, and I get that. You know, so it was old old systems went into distortion, so guys would be running at like one hundred and ten, and you know you would walk out of a venue and your ears would be ringing. You just go to shows and call the office, and you park in the underground at Galleria. Yeah, and it was like heavily insulated in there so it was really dry acoustically and you'd walk in and your ears would just be like and it's like oh my god what's going on and like I'm, I'm lucky i still have my hearing left after after all those years but um i took care of it most of the time i wore earplugs but that isn't what i'm experiencing anymore even i show people the concert footage from rock the park and shout out to adamson and their little uh uh, their new array, well, not little at all, but their new array that you guys yeah, have. BGT? Yeah. Like, yeah. I show videos of the Brian Adams show, standing out front of house, and, like, on my iPhone, Brian's vocals are crystal clear. Yep. And it was loud, and it was powerful, and the bass kicked us in the chest. None of us had ear fatigue. And that was the first, so that was the first North American rollout of that BGT PA. Yeah. Uh, so, like, yeah. yeah the, so now great. technology has gotten to a point where, it's very enjoyable to go to shows. It's not killing people to do it. And it's, it's a, it's a wonderful time. No, it is. And, yeah. and shout out to Adamson on that regard. Uh, they just invited me and my brother for their 40th anniversary. Uh, and it was, it was my first time ironically actually going to the factory. I mean, I've been repping the product now for years. Kyle obviously has been there intimately for, you know, he's done a lot of the beta testing and stuff with them. Um, and R and D and stuff and and he's been there lots but i was my first time there and mm. wow was it ever incredible and to the point where it kind of reminded me of visiting some of the factories that i visited overseas where you know where they they, they make everything there man 
Yeah. It's it's crazy. Like, you know, and they're expanding and now they have their own electronics side and they just built that and they've got plans for future expansion. And like they're literally building all their own circuit boards, all their own stuff is all happening there. And it's 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 awesome. And but you mentioned that that house of blues venue down in LA. That's that's an Adamson rig. Is it? Yeah, it is. Cool. Uh Live Nation put in Adamson at all those venues all over North America. Cool. And uh and yeah, it's, the other ones at uh LA Live. I forget what the actual venue's called, but yeah. the LA Live complex, the whole the whole everything, it's another theater that's there. Mm. Um and same um it's not a Live Nation. I don't think it's a Live Nation venue, but the YouTube theater at SoFi. Okay. That's yeah. another room that's just spectacular sounding. It's yeah, like, yeah. It's it's. I'm all about that, man. My yeah. my first thing you mentioned history. Uh, my first time going to history, my brother was like, "Hey, I got these extra tickets for the muse. You want to go?" Oh, wow. Oh yeah. Muse right. Oh, yeah, cool. I know. <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, let's go, cool. man." So we went, and it was unbelievable. Oh, I bet. Oh yeah, I bet. I saw them at um, Honda Center. Um, uh, it was great. It was actually. Nam, like the I can't remember if it was the April Nam or the June Nam. Okay, yeah. This was the June one because it was this. I think it was just last year. Yeah. Um, uh, and Evanescence was opening for them, mm. and I I know know the guys in Evanescence, so they got us got, got me passes and stuff like that, and you know got to go and hang. And Muse in an Arena is like one of the most incredible shows I've ever been to in my life. Like oh, it was absolutely. so good. So I can only imagine them in the history. The history that'd be incredible. I I'll be honest. That was my first time seeing the band. I've yeah. seen them on on obviously a, a million videos. My brother's a diehard fan. Um, it was unbelievable. Yeah. Like just out of this world. And even if yeah. you're not into the Muse, and I am, but even if you're not into Muse. Like sonically, that show in that room, you could, you didn't have to be a fan. It was it bl yeah. it blew everybody away. I, I've, I'm very comfortable saying I've seen a couple thousand shows at this point in my life, and they're amongst the top ten for yeah, sure. Man. Yeah, like they're great. like it's like Radiohead and it's like U2 and like stuff like that. It's just sonically, visually, everything's just so on point that it's such an enjoyable experience that yeah. yeah you're right even if you're not a fan you're you're not you're you're not gonna look at your phone for that two hours <laughs> but you're gonna be like no, no you're not. <laughs> and, and but but you know what you're right though like sonically if the room is tuned if the room is sounds good and the pa is dialed in and everything's on point yeah. man it is such a better experience yeah. for sure and it's and i think that's Part, part and parcel of what I was saying about it's not just about the live performance going forward. It's about the whole experience. Yeah. Right? From the moment you walk on the property, how you get treated coming through the door, everything. Absolutely. And, and those self-promoted tours, I think, are part of why, you know, people want to say what they want to say about Taylor. But, you know, Kenny Chesney is also fairly self-promoted. And... And there's art, other artists out there too. And, you know, there's something to be said about having a handle on all of that, right? Having a handle on <clears throat> making sure that the total fan experience or the total concert experience is dialed in. Yeah. That's the magic going forward. Doesn't matter if you're doing a show for 10 people, 10,000 people, or 100,000 people. It doesn't matter. Yeah. The fan and concert experience is primo yeah because you you know especially the first show because it could be anybody's first show at any time you know like that last kiss tour was my first time ever seeing kiss same case in point yeah. so you know you never know uh who's out there and to 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 give that that overall experience i think it's the entire it's the entire package yeah. right it's from the minute you you step foot on the property to the minute you walk away and go out for beers after and go, oh man, that was incredible. Or it's like a good, eh, it was all right. It's like a good restaurant. You know, like if you go to a restaurant, a Michelin restaurant and spend hundreds of dollars on a meal for two, if your entire experience was awesome, you're not going to talk for one second about how much it cost you. No. You're going to walk away and go, that was amazing. 
you That's know, true. but if you go in and spend, you know, you go into a mediocre restaurant and spend 40 bucks on a meal and it sucks, you're going to be like, I just wasted 40 bucks on that. So it's, and the reverse could be true. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That restaurant that's coming up that maybe isn't a Michelin could be trying really, really, really hard and it could be really, really great. Yep. And they'll eventually rise to that stature. Right. But it could be you. I've also seen it where really, really great restaurants, staff changes. Oh, yeah. Supplier well, changes. I mean, all like in for example of that and I'll give a give some friends in London a little plug. But the, the Wolf Brothers. Oh, and man. they had Wolf of Wortley now, which is now Company Bar, I guess. But, you know, they, they have a variety of restaurants. But I went to Wolf of Wortley, and it was very expensive. And I've eaten at a very good restaurants all over the world. And I went into that spot with three, two other friends, three of us all together, and spent, you know, $400 or something like that. It was very, very expensive. And I walked out of there so happy that I was able to spend that kind of money because it was so good. It's like, yeah. That was worth any amount of money to me. And yeah, it's, it was the experience it, with friends yep. and it was the, you, you know, know. The, the, the cost became inconsequential. And that's the same thing with, with a good concert. It's like, if you go in and everything meets your expectation, sound, lights, performance, the time you had with your pals while you were there, everything about it, it's like, you're going to talk about that for years. We still remember the U2 show from 20 years ago, right? 100%. Like, yeah, it's still like, like, Again, you and I have both been to thousands of shows, yet we still remember that one like it was yesterday. Yep. And there's a reason for that. So you have to replicate that. You have to. And I've gone to shows by bands that I love that I've left disappointed, almost to the point where I became negative in the fact that it's like, you know what, if I've seen a, a band once and had an amazing time, I don't know that I want to see them again. I don't want to... I don't want to mess up that experience, right? I want to leave that that memory locked in. I get that. And that it's amazing. No, I've not I've not held to that rule. If you love a band, you're gonna to want to you're go gonna see go, them yeah, again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but but I have had those times. You know, the uh, the Pixies was an example. First time I saw the Pixies, one of the best shows of my life. Next time I went, I walked away and I was just like, that sucked. Yeah. I'm like, I never want to see these again. And I passed up the next few opportunities to see them. Then I went and saw them with Weezer, and it was like almost like the first show all over again. I was oh, like, wow. ah, they did it. Okay, cool. So I did that with Phil Collins. Yeah. I saw Phil solo and with Genesis, and that last run he did where he was sitting in the chair, I couldn't do it. Mm. I couldn't do it. I, I was like, nope, I'm not going to remember Phil like that. Yeah. And honestly, I haven't watched YouTube videos either. Right. I can't do it. I remember Phil... So on his solo tour, I went to Palace of Auburn Hills in, in, in Michigan and I saw him and I'll re always remember Phil just, he had this stage that had a semi circle, like it had a circle and he could run and he would just, he would just, he, there was, a, I can't remember what song it was, but, um, I think it was, it was, I don't know if it was take me home or what it was, but he would just run or just might've been Susudio actually. And, it, and he would just run in this circle run and then run and, run and then boom you know the whole the band would kick in and lee sklar was playing bass and but um it was unbelievable yeah. and that's how i want to remember phil collins and uh, the other one i saw him was uh the only i think it was the only show uh in the bemo stadium the soccer stadium in toronto uh, because they hadn't quite finished the stadium yet Mm -hmm. So part of the wall, part of the stadium was open so they could bring all that big production for Genesis in. Oh, cool. And right after that, they finished it. So you can't. So we got to see this open air. It was, I think it was the first show of the North American tour. And, uh, it was, uh, and it was Genesis and it was my first time seeing Genesis and it was, it was unbelievable. Uh, I mean, open air, huge crowd huge tunes great production unbelievable um and so you know i that's how i want to remember it so to your point yes there's there's definitely times when you'll do that right where yeah. where you'll pull back for whatever reason from a band but all the more reason for bands to listen to you know heed the words and you know make sure the fan experience is primo yeah i mean i'm pretty sure that's why uh elton john hung it up um is because you know there's a guy who no opening act comes out on stage three plus hour show full yeah. on 
yeah. right? I've seen him three or four times now. And it's un- it's an unbelievable show. And I can totally respect and understand why he would just hang it up. Because if you yeah. physically can't do that, because that's a lot. If you physically can't do that, and that's the experience that your fans and you, and the people coming to your show are expecting, I get it. Yeah. I get it. Totally. Yeah. I know. I, I have actually just like, oh, I wish I had given the photo of this, but uh, Paul McCartney. Oh, in wow. Vancouver a couple of years ago. And then... Um, more than a couple of years ago, a couple of years before COVID, um, <laughs> like 20. Yeah, it was probably, I think it was probably don't 20, blink. <laughs> yeah. It was like probably 2018. Um, and yeah, he played BC plays and you know, like the, the photo I'm like behind, behind Abe's drum kit. Um, oh, wow. which was, which was a cool shot. But what reminded me of that is you just telling me, it's like these guys that are capable of putting on a three hour show, at that age oh and then and then yeah they know when to throw in the towel and like yeah uh uh i'm surprised paul mccartney can still do it but he did it and he just killed it doing it right it was so good well and they leave it to these guys you're talking about right i'm excited to hear that man i'm excited to hear that there's a budding rock scene coming coming bubbling down in la because that's really cool because I, I think that, that will that's going to work its way through through the system all the way up here, man. Yeah, and I mean, I think I'm optimistic about it. I think, you know, we, we see all these, you know, TikTok and YouTube uh, people, like, you know, these kids doing these things, which a lot of them are incredible. And they get 4 million plays and 5 million plays and 6 million plays. But then that doesn't translate into a live show at all. It's, mm-hmm. you know, they're good for them. They're making their money and I don't, I don't, discredit them at all for that but it it's comforting to know that there'll be interesting live rock and roll shows to go to going forward yeah um Absolutely. and you know and hopefully there's hopefully there's venues for them to do it i mean london's still pretty good with music hall and rum runners and um you know the rec room i think is is doing stuff now and yep. whatever it sucks that we don't have a punk rock dive bar like call the office anymore but you know every every city needs one and london doesn't have one anymore so they'll miss out because of that stuff um but you know you're seeing live nation put up a lot of these these smaller venues uh as well um so if you can get an opportunity for bands to still be able to tour do it economically have the venues to play i think we'll be able to see some cool stuff going forward but venues are key yep Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, one of the things that um, I want to sort of, you know, touch on is uh, the the sort of authenticity of the sound of, of music and stuff, because it's shifting. Right. It's changing. Um, I, and I've noticed this a lot. I mean, you, you you mentioned earlier the you know, the, the label, the Nickelback label, you know, those guys. Um I mean, everybody. So a lot of people are signing country artists. Um, it's a big thing in country now to have backing tracks. Yep, it's a big thing, and uh, you know, it's kind of almost expected in some cases. There's people that just expect it. Oh, we should have a split snake for the for the t- <laughs> ear rig and the tracks, and the, you know, it's just all part of the part part of the parcel, especially for certain certain styles of country coming out of certain cities. Mm-hmm. But. Um, What's your sort of take on that? Because I know you helped to sort of develop a product when you were at radio that was like a backing tracks product, right? It was like the uh, mixer or something. Yeah, the switcher. The switcher? Yeah, so the SW8 and SW8 USB, which are... You have backing tracks, multiple instruments that are recorded, playing out to the system. The last thing you want in the world is a computer failure to happen and people realize all of a sudden they stop hearing those instruments. So the, the switchers will switch between two computer systems seamlessly oh, wow. if something goes down. And there's like, there's a couple other, well, one other company in particular that's making them um, besides radial now. Um, but there it's reality of our current climate. And this comes down to people's expectations when they go to a show. Right. If you go to a show and hear three guys playing on stage, you expect it to have the same impact that their recorded song had. And the reality is, is in the studio, you 
layer tracks upon tracks upon tracks <laughs> upon tracks upon tracks. <laughs> yeah. So all of a sudden, a guitar player, a bass player, and a drummer on stage sounds pretty weak by comparison. Right. So backing tracks fill in the blanks. Now there's there's bands that are not bands. There are artists that are relying way too heavily on backing tracks. Um, that are literally, I mean, you know, go go back to like Millie Vanilli. Sure. You know, you you're lip syncing. So the tracks are everything, right? Yeah. But, you know, I think the bands that are using it um, uh, to accompany the, the musicians on stage, uh, I, I, have, I have zero problem with it. And I don't think that any of people watching would be happy with their performance in a concert if they didn't have them. And I would say yep. 90% okay. of touring acts right now are using it. I laugh my butt off every time I find an online forum where people are arguing about it. And, you know, that's fake. That's doing this. It's doing that. It's like everyone's using them. It's just, you know, you've got to get over it. It's done. So it sounds more and more like the quote unquote CD or record when they're on stage. Um, and it's just accompanying it and filling it in. Yeah. Um, and, and you know you had uh, and I forget his name. I'm sorry, uh, Nelly Furtado's uh, playback oh, uh, engineer. On yeah, I, I always call it, I used to, his old former name was DJ Shine. Right. Yeah. 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 Was, uh, yeah. I used to call. Him, but, uh, no, Jason, <laughs> well, yeah. When I was watching J Jason Spann. Yeah. When I was watching that podcast, and I've worked with like a hundred of those guys. I'm surprised I never worked with him directly. But it's funny because like there are a lot of guys making a living, and you can look this up. When we first started making the SW8 at radio, we couldn't talk about it. Cause it was just, it was so top secret that people were even using tracks. Now go on YouTube and Google, you know, Post Malone's playback engineer. And you'll see like an incredible like tutorial on what they're using it for. And it's everything from just effects for the, like, with the vocals that he's actually singing to like, yeah, just these weird instruments that might only come up like, you know, three times an entire show. You're not going to hire a musician to play that. Yeah. You know, one of the only exceptions to the rule is Arcade Fire. And then, like, I kind of laugh at them. It's like, I went to their show, and it's like, yeah, they don't use tracks. They just put another musician on stage to play it. You've got 14 guys playing <laughs> playing stuff on stage, and it's incredible, but they're all such good musicians. I'm like, yeah, nobody else is capable of that. Well, that's it. <laughs> that's it. It's not sustainable for the vast majority, right? Yeah. But the vast majority is expected to get to that level. Yeah, and right? that's, I think, the people that argue the most about it online saying it's not fair, it's not this, it's not that, they'd be the first people to walk out of the show and complain if it didn't have it. So they can remain happily oblivious to the fact that it's happening, but it's happening. <laughs> and it's happening with almost everybody in some way. And the obvious ones have been obvious for years, right? Yeah. So, like, I just watched a YouTube video the other day of... I think it was pink and she's in this harness and she's spinning 360 degrees, like 40 <laughs> feet in the air on two wires. So she's literally not only spinning in a, in a rate in a round harness like this, she's also moving left, right, up and down. Right. Like, yeah. and she's got a headset on, like you can see it. Oh yeah. But you can also see that her mouth is moving kind of not to the, the music, yeah. you know, like, yeah. come on, man. Or she, I mean, you, you know, know, like, uh, uh, Britney Spears, like the Britney Spears shows, you know, she'd, you know, she'd be wearing the, what we used to call the Madonna mic. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the, crown, headset, the crown headset. headset. Yeah. The headset mic. Yeah. And, you know, she'd stop and like talk to people in the audience while her vocals were still going on. Yeah. And well, then she put it back in. Now, both both yeah. Pink and Britney, I know for a fact, because I've watched their shows enough times, they will sing. They do sing. And they yeah. will, which will accompany their tracks. But again, you're expecting what you hear off the record live. Well, off the record, they probably had like multiple, multiple, multiple vocal takes. Oh, yeah. That are all, be, you know, being pl played back at the same and time. And layered. Nobody, yeah, exactly. Layered, layered, Talking layered. about track upon, like, yeah. you know, track upon track. So you want to replicate that. You you have to use tracks, and which is like, I'm a technology guy through and through. I, you know, I'm responsible for over 30 products at radio. It's like, I like technology, and I'm fully able to, and I also, you know, have a recording studio and record bands. I use all the crazy plugins and I do all the cheat codes to make stuff sound incredible. Like 
I would be disappointed if somebody didn't go out and try to replicate that the best they can in live world. Yeah. yeah. So it's all just, you know, it's, it's another instrument. The sound engineer in the studio and the sound engineer live is another member of the band and they are doing everything they can to make the band sound as good as they did in the studio. So yeah. Again, I, I don't I don't like somebody's lip syncing or somebody that's trying to pretend they're doing something they're not. But if it's a good a good accompaniment and makes the show sound that much better and makes it much more enjoyable, then fill your boots. Amen to that. Yeah. So are you said you're headed back to the studio in Vancouver at some point? Is that the is that the plan? Uh no, so um that studio as we know it is being dismantled at this current oh really in time okay uh, uh my studio partner that was in a, a separate building from his house yeah, yeah uh but he sold the property oh yeah and so he's moving so we're going to likely rebuild that um in another spot uh, okay, cool. starting next month nice um uh but i'm going back to um for the time being i'm going back to la Nice. Uh, Cause I got a few, few things I'm working with, uh, working with an artist there. Um, a friend of mine, um, just on a song with her working with another artist in Vancouver. So I've been kind of doing some recording projects Sweet. in my, in my downtime. There you go. Uh, well, I figure out what I want to do when I grow up. Hey. <laughs> cause, cause you've done nothing so far, Jay. <laughs> exactly. You really got to work harder. At yeah. <laughs> Travel a little more. Maybe. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, dude, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. No, I absolutely love to be here, man. I really appreciate it. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning in to Music City Live. We'll see you on the next podcast. Take care, everybody. Thank you for watching Music City Live. If you liked this episode, like the video. And for more clips and episodes, subscribe to the channel. Feel free to join the conversation by commenting below and visit us at musiccitylive.show.com.